Committee on Foreign Affairs will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine prior successful policies aimed at addressing the international migration crisis at the southern border and the effect of the Biden administration's decision to terminate those policies. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. In my 20 years in Congress, including when I was chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, <clears throat> and as a former federal prosecutor in Texas, tasked with securing our border, I've never seen our border this chaotic. Simply put, the border is broken. What we're witnessing today is, is unprecedented. In total, since President Biden took office, we've had more than 7.5 million encounters at the southern border. This is the population of nine states combined. This includes 7,000 special interest aliens and nearly 300 apprehensions of individuals on the terror watch list, compared to 14 under the previous administration. The security risk to our country is real, and our adversaries around the world are capitalizing on our open border policies. It only took 19 terrorists to perpetrate 9-11, as the FBI testified before the Homeland Security Committee uh, just two weeks ago. This crisis is a self-inflicted wound and a direct result of this administration's policies. <clears throat> Upon taking office, the Biden administration rescinded the Migrant Protection Protocols, also known as Remain in Mexico. Under MPP, migrants were removed to Mexico while their asylum claims were adjudicated in the United States. Now, without MPP, they are released into the interior under a failed catch and release program. <clears throat> this graph shows the ports of entry in which MPP was instituted. Yet one rescission, one stroke of the pen ended that. It ended MPP. One of the first days of office is what the Biden administration did, was to rescind this policy that was working. And it allowed the chaos that we see now at the border to reach to historic levels. Now, as someone who's a, as a both federal prosecutor, chairman of Homeland, now this committee, every major port of entry was covered under this program. Yet one rescission, one stroke of the pen, ended this successful program and allowed this chaos at the border to reach these levels, historic levels. So in my many meetings with Border Patrol, at agents at the border, and I've been there many times, they tell me very bluntly, when I say, was well, there a cause and effect, they say, yes, sir, yes, Mr. Chairman. They tell me very bluntly the rescission of this policy had a direct cause and effect on the chaos at the border. The sad thing is we had the policies that were working. I spent over 25 years on this, and I never thought we would actually see it fixed. The sad thing is we had it fixed, and now it's, it's absolutely devastating. We need to turn off the pull factor, the magnet driving this, that will also shut down the cartels. MPP did that. Under MPP, U.S. apprehensions of migrants at the southwest border fell by 62 percent from May 2019 to August 2019. Imagine that a 62% decrease from just May to August in one year. That also, importantly, financially crippled and brought to their knees the cartels that were profiting off human trafficking and other illicit activity that we know now they're making upwards of billions of dollars. Additionally, asylum cooperative agreements were integral to stemming the tide of illegal aliens. They required asylum seekers to apply for asylum upon arrival in the first safe country. By allowing aliens to enter the interior of this country freely, we are signaling to them, come on in, we're open for business. The border is wide open. And we all know when they get in, we don't have detention space, and guess what? The very first bill I ever introduced in Congress 20 years ago was to end catch and release. Here we are today, 20 years later, 
back to the policies that have failed our country and the American people, catch and release. And what will happen to these 7.5 million encounters, many of whom are in this country now with no legal status, living in the shadows? Well, I'll tell you what's going to happen. The young girls are going to be sex trafficked. The young males will go to MS-13. They'll be paying the cartels off. They'll be inv involved in drug trafficking. And we've already seen this. They're going to be forced into gangs and labor rings. Over 2,000 migrants and counting have died trying to make the dangerous journey across the border in the last three fiscal years. And 35% are women and children who are sexually abused throughout their journey at the hands of these brutal cartel members. It was just reported that there are rape tents in the Daring Gap that leads into from South America to Mexico. 400 women and children have been brutalized and raped. And again, when, when they get here, what happens? We see 30 children being sent to the same house. Sponsors, family members sponsoring 30 children to the same house. That cannot be a familial thing. They are brought there for one purpose, for money, for human trafficking, and to exploit them sexually. Sadly, they have not even been vetted in many cases because our secretary, Mr. Mayorkas, lifted those restrictions. This is turning into a major human trafficking event, the biggest I've seen in my lifetime. And it's right here in the United States. And it's only going to get worse if we don't change the policies back to what worked. This administration has created a criminal enterprise right now in the United States of America that will have ramifications for years to come. And tragically, most tragically, over the last two years, nearly 150,000 people have died from fentanyl poisoning. You know, I've had five children, just their high school alone, they've been to five funerals. Five funerals. Tell that to the parents, they took what they thought was ADD or Xanax, and they never woke up. That number is nearly triple the number of American deaths due to the entire duration of the entire Vietnam War. And we only expect, expect these deaths to continue to get worse. <clears throat> I've always said the borders are our last line of defense. So as we look at this national security uh, bill we're working on, and I agree with it, what are the major threats to the United States? Well, there's Putin in Europe, there's Chairman Xi, Pacific, Ayatollah, Middle East, what he's doing right now with Hamas and Israel. And guess what? The last line of defense is our southern border. And we have no defense. I've always said we need to push our borders out. Push the borders out. Stop playing de defense one yard from our goal line. Push it out to their end zone. And that's what MPP did. That's what Remain in Mexico did. And regrettably, I, be I believe this administration has been derelict in its duty and its responsibility to protect the American people. Put simply, the President and Secretary Mayorkas are aiding and abetting this crisis at our southern border, and I told them so at our hearing at the Homeland Security Committee, aiding and abetting under the federal statute, human trafficking, hundreds of thousands of deaths, fentanyl poisoning. As I said, I've been dealing with this issue for almost three decades. I thought we had it solved. I really did. And I could go home finally to my constituents and say, you know what? We got it done. Well, guess what? This administration, this administration, by abandoning the policies that worked, have royally messed it up. And am I a little emotional about this? You're darn right. When I go home to Texas, 
and I talk to my constituents, they are angry, and I am their only voice up here. But my voice reflects their voice of their anger about what is happening. My state has been the brunt, borne the brunt of this. Billions of dollars of cost to the people of the state of Texas, and their, my state legislature appropriating all this money when it's really a federal responsibility. I think it's well past time to get back to what worked. I don't care, I told my organization, I don't care what you call this. I know you're doing this because it was a prior administration, but you know what, it worked. Call it what you want, but let's get back to what works for the, the sake of the American people. I hope that in this national security package we're working on, we finally have a chance to get border security back front and center, and I hope that we can get it done. I've talked to the ranking member, he's open. I've talked to the Secretary of State. I think, I believe that they are finally opening their eyes to maybe getting back uh, to what worked, you know, so well. But as Reagan said, trust but verify. We'll see. We will see. Uh, elections have consequences. This one had a really grave consequence. And I believe that if we don't get this thing back on track, we're going to have another consequence in the next election because the American people are fed up with this, are sick and tired of having a border that is not secure. And it is within the jurisdiction of this committee. While well, Homeland that I chaired had many, this committee has jurisdiction over the principle that worked the greatest, and that is the migrant protection protocols and remain in Mexico. That's why we marked that up out of this committee we passed it out of committee, and we put that provision in H.R. 2, which was the House Republicans' border security bill that now we are trying to get on the national security aid package. As I talked to the senators uh, on the other side of this uh, Congress uh, to work to get this in, and when I talked to them, please put this provision in because this is the driving thing. This is the thing that really made the difference. Now, we can put up all the stuff we want down there and barbed wire and all that stuff, but if we don't change the asylum policies like this, we're not going to get to the root cause of the problem. So, you know, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today, particularly Gene Hamilton, who, if y'all don't know, was the architect of this program. He worked at Department of Homeland Security, and then he's worked, he worked at DOJ, where I worked for many years. Chad Wolf, as you all know, is a former Secretary of Homeland Security, implemented this policy. And Adam, sir, thank you for being here to give a, uh, I, I, I appreciate the human rights perspective here. And we have some ideas as how to deal with that as well. You know, I know the tent cities was an issue, but I think detention space, um, adequate, that's humane, is, is one consideration we should be looking at. So. Anyway, I want to thank the members for being here for this. I hope we have a vigorous debate on this and an honest debate about what's best for the American people. Uh, and again, I want to thank the witnesses. And I would normally turn to the ranking member. Um, he's on the floor with my $6 billion being sanctioned from going into Iran. He's a little busy right now. Um, but with that, I will now uh, turn to the witnesses. Uh, for their testimony, and when Mr. Meek shows up, we'll give him a moment to give an opening statement. But Mr. Chad Wolf is forming Acting Secretary of Homeland, currently serving as Executive Director, Chief uh, Strategy Officer, and Chair of America First Policy Institute. Mr. Gene Hamilton served as Counselor to the Attorney General, uh, Senior Counselor to the Secretary of Homeland, and is currently Vice President and General Counsel of America First Legal. And Mr. Adam Igeson, is Director of Defense Oversight at Washington, at the Washington Office on Latin America. I want to thank all three of you for being here. And I now, uh, uh, rep I now recognize uh, Mr. <coughs> Wolf for his testimony. Well, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee about the ongoing humanitarian and security crisis at our southern border. As someone who previously led the Department of Homeland Security, I can say without any doubt or equivocation that the security and the integrity of our southern border is the worst that we have seen since 9-11, and it is the direct result of intentional and ineffective border strategy by the Biden administration. 
It is no coincidence that the three fiscal years that correspond with this administration are the three worst fiscal years of illegal alien border apprehensions ever recorded. Today, there are no deterrence policies in place and no consequences for violating our immigration laws. This administration has spent three years prioritizing the processing of illegal aliens and releasing them into American communities and has refused time and time again to change their strategy. As a result, approximately 9.6 million illegal aliens have entered the U.S. in the last several years, a population that would make it the 11th largest state. The security concerns with this level of unchecked illegal immigration cannot be overstated. Today, we know of a record number of known and suspected terrorists, special interest aliens, and other public safety and national security threats attempting to cross that border daily. And those are the ones that we know about. There is another 1.8 million known gotaways that should concern every member of this committee and every American. Clearly, today's border security system is unrecognizable from the America First border security policies of the Trump administration. And in all candor, the Biden administration is the first administration of, in my lifetime of either political party to actively take steps to diminish the security along our southern border. One such example is the termination of the highly successful migrant protection protocols or remain in Mexico. In 2008 and 2019, 2018 and 2019, the Trump administration was confronted uh, with caravans of illegal aliens approaching the border, including family units from the Northern Triangle countries, surging to the border and making fraudulent asylum claims at the hopes that they would be released into American communities. Misguided court rulings limited the time that we could detain those family units, even though that we knew across the board close to 90% apprehended at the border were making fraudulent claims. Unwilling to perpetuate the destructive catch and release policy, DHS worked in tandem with the Departments of Justice, State, and the White House to find solutions that were grounded in the rule of law. What we found was previously untapped legal authority in the Immigration and Naturalization Act that allows the U.S. to require illegal aliens who make asylum claims at the border to wait in Mexico for the duration of their immigration court proceedings. Establishing MPP was not easy, but with President Trump's leadership, the Mexican government worked with us to get the program started in January of 2019 at three locations across the border and subsequently agreed to implement MPP to the fullest extent authorized under U.S. law. The goals of the program were simple, to provide asylum protections quickly to those who truly qualified, quickly return aliens who lacked a valid claim, and to discourage future asylum fraud. And the re results speak for themselves. Aliens enrolled in MPP who qualified for asylum received those protections in a matter of months instead of years. Over the course of MPP, around 70,000 aliens were returned to Mexico. Those whose claims were denied returned home, and many others abandoned their fraudulent claims. And by the end of FY19, there was an 80% reduction in border apprehensions of Northern Triangle family units, which was the main driver of the 2018 border crisis. MPP was a recognition also of Mexico's joint responsibility over illegal immigration in the region. And while Mexican officials were not enthusiastic about the program initially, they quickly realized and recognized the benefits of reducing the illegal flow through Mexico. In addition to MPP, we worked with Mexican officials to deploy over 20,000 Mexican soldiers and National Guard to both their southern and northern borders to curb the flow and push them to severely curtail the use of freight trains by migrants to come to the southern border. In stark contrast today, we see a border in chaos and crisis because this administration refuses to impose consequences and does not demand the same level of cooperation from the government of Mexico. This administration consistently points out that major U.S. immigration law has not changed since the mid-1990s. They are correct that the laws have not changed between administrations, just the refusal of the current one to follow their legal obligations. The MPP authority is just one of many examples of enforcement tools on the books that the current administration refuses to use. Today's historic border crisis is a policy crisis, not a funding crisis. Proven effective policies espoused by career Border Patrol officials are not being implemented, and it is by design. Simply throwing more funding at the problem will never solve the issue. Rather, we should use common sense and return to policies and programs like MPP that have proven successful and legal to secure the border. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Now is uh, Mr. Hamilton for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman McCall, 
Ranking Member Meeks and all members of the committee for having this important hearing. The Biden administration knows that using tools like MPP and asylum cooperative agreements and other effective uses of the laws that Congress has provided would end the crisis at the border. They know it because it's been done before. They did it under the leadership of President Trump. But they do not appear to desire an end to the self-inflicted crisis for a variety of reasons, including their failure to acknowledge the basic fact that releasing illegal aliens into the United States results in more illegal aliens coming. Sadly for the American people and our republic, the Biden administration's intentional sabotaging of our immigration system and decimation of our borders is not just some experiment in an ivory tower with no consequences. We cannot capture the true extent of the long-term effects of the Biden administration's decisions with presently available data. But by all available measures, they can be described in two words, catastrophic failure. Indeed, Southwest border encounters are at record highs. There have been more than 6.5 million encounters at the Southwest border during the Biden administration. And there are no signs of it stopping. In fact, internal DHS sources indicate that the number of encounters this month in November will exceed 240,000. Those numbers do not, of course, include the number of gotaways, which are in the millions over the last three years. DHS is releasing the overwhelming majority of the illegal aliens that it encounters at the southwest border. As of March 2023, there were at least 2.4 million illegal aliens that DHS had released during the Biden administration who were still here today. Nationwide encounters are at record highs. There have been roughly 7.86 million nationwide encounters since February of 2021. Most significantly, that number includes the Biden administration's abuse of the parole power through programs like the CHNV, which brings in an additional 30,000 aliens into the United States every single month. The abuse of the parole power is essentially a shell game, which allows the administration to claim that it is reducing the number of illegal crossings at the border, when in actuality, their policies are making it worse. This shell game is apparent throughout their policies across the administration, as reflected in their counting of cases they terminate or dismiss as completed cases at EOIR. Deportations are statistically non-existent. At the same time that CBP is releasing millions of illegal aliens into the United States, ICE is not deporting anyone. In short, there is no credible threat of deportation for these millions of illegal aliens that the Biden administration is releasing into the United States. The consequences of these radical policies are significant. The United States cannot possibly vet and screen these millions of illegal aliens pouring across our borders into the United States. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying or they sincerely believe wrongly that the absence of derogatory information in our databases is the equivalent of a determination that an individual does not threaten the safety and security of the American people. It is a practical, factual, and legal impossibility. Aside from the harmful consequences this situation creates for the American people, our adversaries are undoubtedly taking advantage of this situation. Further, and particularly timely, given Saturday marking the 200th anniversary of the announcement of the Monroe Doctrine. These policies exacerbate existing international problems that create increasing regional and global instability. So long as the young people and prime working age populations of countries believe they can illegally enter and be released into the United States to work, with or without formal authorization, they will continue to attempt to do so. Consequently, they will not be in their home countries to create businesses, to create economic and political stability, and improve conditions in their home countries. And so instead, 
their home countries can and will increasingly rely on predatory lending and investment from China for economic development, which further bolsters authoritarian governments and destabilizes local populations. This perpetuates an endless cycle of economic and political failure that nefarious state and non-state actors can and will exploit. If we desire increased stability in and influence over the Western Hemisphere, we should start by enforcing our immigration laws. The situation is dire and the consequences are significant. The only question is what we do about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Isaacson for his opening statement. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, thank you for holding this hearing uh, and for inviting me to participate. You're holding it at an important time. We're seeing the most migration since World War II, in not just here, but in the whole hemisphere. The UN Refugee Est Agency estimates that right now in the Western Hemisphere, there are more than 22 million people on the move. And of those, maybe 3 million tried to come to the United States in 2023, and many of them were deported. So the United States is actually getting less than one-seventh of the regional total. Many people are seeking asylum. That population started increasing 10 years ago. We've been seeing this for a while, but neither the United States nor most countries around the region have adjusted to it. That's why so much migration does look chaotic right now. Adjusting to and managing asylum seeker flows is an administrative problem. It's solvable. It's about throughput and due process, but we don't solve it by abandoning a core value about preserving human, human life. This value solidified after World War II. It's in our laws. It says, if someone on our soil says they fear for their life or freedom if returned to their country, then you at least have to give them due process before deporting them and allow them to stay if they prove that that fear is real. Due process is key. If we improved it, we'd actually see fewer asylum seekers than we do now because they wouldn't be here so long. Due process means not having to wait years for your immigration court hearings to start. That's the case right now, though, because we have 659 immigration courts struggling to hear 2.2 million cases, many of them asylum cases. The wait inside the United States does become its own pull factor, but we can fix that. But we don't fix it through deterrence. People who fear for their lives just aren't going to stop coming here. You've seen the video of people crawling through the barbed wire. They're not going to stop coming just because the experience is miserable. That's never worked, and I think if you look at the data over the last 20 years, it shows that. In, instead, we, now, there's not really much time to talk about it right now, but we need more processing on the line, too. If we had more processing coordinators, weights would be less, there'd be greater efficiencies, and we'd have freed up a lot more Border Patrol agents and CBP officers. But, you know, in fact, asylum shouldn't be at the center here. It's pretty terrible that people need to travel overland for hundreds or thousands of miles, very dangerous miles, just to set foot on U.S. soil and ask for protection. This year, I've spent two weeks each in Honduras and in Colombia. I've seen entire families with tiny kids, some with strollers, believe it or not, getting on boats to go walk through the Dadian Gap. I found myself talking to people from Pakistan fleeing religious persecution in dusty border towns on the Honduras-Nicaragua border. I've watched people from China fleeing authoritarianism cross the border from Ecuador into Colombia online with me with no idea what awaits them. That's awful. Asylum really should be a last resort for people who need protection, and we have to make the journey unnecessary. There need to be other pathways. Until we can change our 1990s laws, the Presidential Humanitarian Parole Authority, it's not ideal, but it's one of a handful of existing options. And U.S. diplomacy and aid programs have to work with Latin America and the Caribbean to make people who need to migrate feel welcome and prosper in other countries throughout the region. That's a key element of the 2022 Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection, and it's a key element of a lot of U.S. aid since 2021. And some aid has gone to target the root causes of why people are migrating today. That's security, education, poverty reduction, but it's especially fostering democracy and getting squarely on the side of people fighting corruption and defending human rights. People don't flee countries that have responsive, accountable governance, governments. When I talk about helping other countries do more to integrate migrants, you might say, well, isn't that, isn't that making them remain in Mexico? Well, no, it's not. Uh, instead of letting people assimilate and start a new life in a safer part of Mexico, remain in Mexico sent people into some of Mexico's most violent cities, homeless, separated from their support networks. More than 1,500 of them that we know of were kidnapped, killed, raped, or assaulted, and really the monitoring stopped after the COVID pandemic began. 
When I visited Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez during the second half of 2019, I talked to families stuck in shelters that were not set up for months long family stays. These shelters were always on the edges of town where criminal groups operated freely and intimidated them. Aid workers showed me the area near the Ciudad Juarez port of entry gate where kidnappers were waiting many days for the MPP arrivals to come so they could grab them. Yet still people persisted with their U.S. asylum cases because they had genuine fear. Remain in Mexico took people who were already victims and it re-victimized them and we can't go back to doing that. And even if we tried to, it's not clear whether Mexico would go along with it. Even during the Trump years, Remain in Mexico was 70,000 people. That is just a fraction of um, the flow today. And you know, ultimately we have to remember that Title 42 started in March of 2020 before Remain in Mexico had even been around for really for a year. And that, you know, Remain in Mexico certainly made asylum harder to reach, that, but that was literally compared to what Title 42 did. But during the Title 42 years, the numbers went up. In closing, I know we disagree on policies like Remain in Mexico, and some of our disagreements are philosophical and values-based, but we all do agree that the current system is failing badly. The way forward requires <clears throat> that we be pragmatic but humane, and thank you. I look forward to discussing more of it. Hey, Mr. Eisenstein, and, and I agree with you. The current system is not working, and I appreciate your candor on, on that. And, um, you know, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Hamilton that, <clears throat> you know, uh, what happened to the Monroe Doctrine? And as you stated, sir, um, with all the, uh, you know, like when I was growing up, it was, it was coming from Mexico primarily. Now, you know, when I chaired Homeland, even if there were a handful of special interest aliens or a handful on the terror watch list, that was a big event. And I remember Secretary Jay Johnson and I talking about who are these people. But now you have 7,000 special interest aliens and almost 300 on the terror watch list. Those numbers alarm me and concern me. Now, to Mr. Hamilton, you, you were the one, you were the legal architect for the Migrant Protection Protocol program, Remain in Mexico working both at Department of Homeland Security and then later the, my uh, old alma mater, the Department of Justice. What I was uh, interested in, this is not some new law. A lot of people think this is like some, you know, uh, some novel approach by the, the Trump administration, when in fact, the law had been on the books for nearly 30 years. And that is under the INA 235, Section B to C, the federal statute. Can you explain to the members? I mean, this is like you're taking a 30 year old federal statute and you're implementing, implementing that statute to achieve security at the border. Can you explain how you did that? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an important point that you make because precisely that 8 USC 1225 B2C authorizes the program that we know as Remain in Mexico slash MPP. That was part of a broader package of enforcement tools that Congress provided in 1996 in IRA-IRA. There was a whole host of tools that Congress provided in that statute, including another one called expedited removal. Now, of course, the administrations didn't use expedited removal in any kind of meaningful sense, truly, until the Bush administration. And even then, they only did it for a limited population in a limited time frame. And so, what the whole thinking here is when you use a program like MPP is to take the tools that Congress provides you and you respect the laws that Congress has said they have created and you use those tools to create security and to create a situation that works for the United States. And the whole point here, as I said in my opening statement, is that the whole goal of anyone crossing the border very few of them are actually true asylum seekers. Most people are just opportunist, and that's just how it is. Folks are coming here to seek a better life. They are not actually seeking asylum. So you can put their claims, you can make the, where the rubber meets the road is when you say, well, if you wanna pursue your claim, you're gonna do it, but you're gonna do it by waiting outside of the United States. A lot of folks abandon their claims, a lot of you call their bluff. And the folks who were truly oppressed and tr were truly persecuted were the ones who stuck it out and had their claims adjudicated. And imagine that, enforcing the laws that Congress has passed. That's simply what this is, a 30-year-old statute. And it worked. In three months, you had a 62% decrease. And we were on the path to finally securing this border until the new administration came in. Secretary Wolf, 
you saw this under your watch. Now we have 7.5 million encounters. God knows what we're going to do with them in the United States. 300 special interest aliens, 200, 300 terror watch list, uh, hundreds of thousands of fentanyl deaths, human trafficking larger than I've seen in my lifetime as both a federal prosecutor and chairman of Homeland. Do you believe there's a direct cause and effect between the rescission of this program and what we currently see today? And I associate myself with Mr. Hamilton's words. They know better. Secretary Mayorkas knows better. And that goes to intent. They know better and they don't care. So well, without a doubt, I would say absolutely. There's definitely a, a causation there. And it's not a, just MPP. It's, you know, all the other programs that were torn down, whether it's the asylum cooperative agreements and a number of regulations, you know, during the Trump administration that all worked together as a system. Uh, some were more effective than others, uh, but it was a patchwork of policy programs and regulations uh, that helped secure that border. And as each one was taken down, starting with MPP, but others were taken down as well, we started seeing the unraveling of the border. And you could say, well, maybe they just didn't know better. Well, that wasn't, that's not true. We briefed them during the transition. We told them exactly what would happen. If they started tearing down these, you would run out of Border Patrol space. You would run out of processing. Everything that we see today, we talk to them, this is what's going to occur. Um, and of course, it happened anyway. So absolutely. Can I, can I follow up because my time's running out? It, it, what if the administration had not changed? And this may get to Mr. Isaacson's point about detention space and infrastructure on the border. What would have, in implementing MPP, had the administration stayed in power, what was the plan? Yeah. I'll take a first stab. Um, obviously, we had implemented MPP uh, a handful of months. So that would have been a program that was started, and so we would continue to improve it. We would continue to see more facilities along the border that we're hearing MPP cases. You would have seen uh, you know, better uh, facilities there that both ICE, USCIS officers, attorneys would be in, immigration judges, VTC then. You would have seen conditions in northern Mexico. We were working with the government of Mexico, other not NGOs there to improve those conditions. I think overall what you would have seen is the program continually to progress to get better and better over time. When we implemented, obviously it was at the very beginning. Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Chairman, I, I completely agree with uh, Mr. Wolf. Look, one of the things that's missing at our ports of entry in terms of physical infrastructure are spaces for immigration courts. And that's one area in which we could have made massive improvements. And I think that likely with the work of uh, working with folks in Congress here, that could have been an actual possibility. And in fact, creating an actual immigration court facility at every single port of entry along the northern and southern borders you would have had a much more uh, uh, streamlined situation in, 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 on top of all of the things that Chad I, I couldn't agree with you more, <clears throat> Mr. Isaacson, Isaacson. What do you think about that approach if we had the courts at the ports of entry? If you had the courts at the ports of entry, people would not have time to prepare their cases. Uh, they would not be able to get the evidence they needed. They would not be able to find counsel. Um, it takes due process usually. Is no, I, if it's months. in the United States, ports of entry, due process would have to attach and apply because it's under the Constitution of the United States. So I, mm -hmm. my time's expired, but I respectfully disagree. Um, and I know, <laughs> I know you're in an outnumbered situation here, but uh, I'll recognize uh, Mr. Sherman. I'm sure Mr. Hamilton isn't suggesting that we need an immigration court at every northern port of entry. I don't know that many Canadians who are claiming asylum uh, as they cross from, from the north. Uh, well, they're moving south. They're from the north. Yes. Um, but I do agree that we do need more immigration uh, judges. Uh, where they would be housed uh, is, a, is a detail I don't have an opinion on. Uh, America needs immigrants. Uh, if we don't have immigration, our population starts to decline in 2038. This is a country that has typically had 2-3% uh, population growth per year. Our population starts to decline. We start having the problems of Italy and Japan. Even with immigration, our population will start to decline in 2081. That's because for all of these talks of giant numbers of people coming into our country, uh, currently net migration, documented and undocumented, 
is only 875,000 people. That's according to the census, and that takes into account the fact that hundreds of thousands of people, some American-born, some who uh, uh, were born elsewhere but uh, leave the United States, and so our net migration is 875,000. Uh, as to uh, fentanyl, uh, I think it's simply wrong to blame Im immigrants. The fentanyl comes in vehicles. We have thousands and ten hundreds of thousands of containers coming in from Mexico, but we don't inspect but I believe a quarter of them. Um, uh, Mr. Isaacson, do, 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 I, uh, do I have that right? And is, can you think of a reason why we shouldn't charge the importers to have every container in inspected, except if perhaps we're worried about Walmart's profits? <laughs> Um, it would make sense to have the equipment there uh, to inspect. I mean, there is some logistical stuff that has to happen over the next couple of years, but yeah, I mean, 90% of the fentanyl And the, the vast found. majority of those crossing our borders now and asking for asylum, the first person they talk to is Border Patrol. Right. Does Border Patrol look inside the, uh, the backpack? Uh, when uh, people turn themselves in? Border, border Patrol confiscates the majority of people's belongings, and yes. Sounds like a really bad way to bring in fentanyl. Uh, <laughs> um, now, uh, there's this idea that terrorists are going to come into our country. We have a system designed to, that, that, that is dealing with a lot of people who aspire to come to the United States and work for minimum wage. Uh, we all, in our yeah, it, 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 we've all encountered undocumented immigrants in this country. Um, none of them impressed me as being James Bond. <laughs> uh, they're hardworking people who want to, who aspire uh, to move up the ladder, but they start at the bottom. Uh, do we really think that foreign intelligence agents could be deterred? Uh, how difficult would it be for them uh, to get a tourist uh, visa uh, simply by, you know, claiming to, to, uh, uh, to, to be tourists, claiming, uh, you know, all you have to do is steal a Norwegian passport. Uh, can you think of a system that would be successful in preventing uh, Iranian or Russian agents from sneaking into the United States, perhaps with a visa? I mean, it's it's something that we have to worry about. You're right, more in our airports and, and other ports of entry than at the border. I mean, it is something we always have to be vigilant about at the border. Uh, but it is, you know, it, at the border, there are many other things to be concerned about. And the, I suspect if we could ever get our hands on a list of the countries of those 300, the nationalities of those 300 people who are on the terrorist watch list, we'd find that they're mostly from Colombia, people who had demobilized from the armed conflict there. But that's only what we know. And then you have a lot of people just with a similar name. Right. Um, we have a $485 million humanitarian aid assistance program identified by uh, President Biden to help Latin America. You describe how millions and millions of people in Latin America are on the move. Uh, will that $485 million help create stable economic conditions that reduce the number of, my, uh, of people leaving their home countries in Latin America? It will, especially if it's going after corruption and human rights abuse and the reasons that people leave. But the, the, the results won't be felt immediately. It's, it's not a short-term fix, but it is a more permanent long-term fix. I yield back. <coughs> Chair recognizes Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this important hearing, and welcome to this uh, committee, gentlemen, and thank you for your testimonies. You know, one of, the, one of the many shocking but predictable consequences of non-enforcement of U.S. immigration laws is the cruelty imposed on victims of human sex to labor trafficking. Now, I'm the author of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 and four subsequent trafficking laws. I created the, the TIP efforts and, and everything else. It was a bipartisan effort. But that said, I have been shocked by the lack of, seeming lack of concern on the part of the administration when it comes to how many people are being forced into trafficking. We're providing uh, the predators the ability, proximity to victims, especially children. Uh, and I, had a, I shared a hearing just a few months ago 
Uh, and I asked Ambassador Dyer, and I created that position in the 2003 reauthorization, and I told her beforehand, I'm going to ask you about the 85,000 unaccompanied minors that we've lost contact with, ORR as well as uh, Homeland Security and HHS. Um, how many of them have been forced into trafficking? And she says, talk to Homeland Security. And I deeply respect her, but she did not have an answer. I still don't have an answer. And I wonder if any of you might have some insights into that. Uh, I have a bill called the SECURE Act. It's called Safeguarding Endangered Children Unaccompanied and at Risk of Exploitation Act. Uh, and, and it will penalize the various agencies if they do not do welfare and whereabouts and get to the bottom of this. Because those children, we believe, are at grave risk of sex and labor trafficking or both. And your thoughts? Mr. Wolf. Well, I, I'm certainly concerned. During the Biden administration, there's been about 500,000 unaccompanied alien children that have come across that border. Again, unaccompanied means they come across with no adult, uh, no parent uh, of any kind, and almost all of them are trafficked. All of them are trafficked. Uh, they stay in Border Patrol DHS custody for, for a very short period of time, uh, usually hours, uh, 72 hours or below. Then they are transferred to HHS and ORR where they are then uh, processed and, and placed with sponsors. Unfortunately, what we have seen from this administration um, is a loosening of the sponsor requirements. Uh, because their facilities were backing up because you had so many children coming in, early on in this administration, uh, they stopped the full vetting uh, and background checking procedures of sponsors and all household members in that sponsor's household. Uh, they also did away with fingerprints um, they did away with rapid DNA testing along the border, and we used that, Border Patrol, DHS Border Patrol used that to establish that familiar relationship, uh, because if it didn't occur, then we were going to separate and we were, gonna, we were going to rescue that child from that trafficking situation that was on current. Rapid DNA testing is no longer occurring along the border, and I have no idea why. There is no valid reason to stop that. Uh, it goes to the heart of making sure that these children are safe. And the fact that you, we've now had three years of this policy that I've outlined in one manner or another, and it has not changed, is, is unfathomable. Thank you. You know, the, the issue of, of the cartels and everyone else who are exploiting these people, one, one of the presidents of a Central American country, Guatemala, told me that 80% of the women and young girls uh, are sexually abused somewhere along the line during their, their trip. Uh, and some, it becomes more permanent as they're put into a, a trafficking ring. Uh, your sense of that, I mean, why isn't, and he was speaking how upset he was about it all uh, when I talked to him, but they couldn't stop it. And they're looking to us to try to mitigate that harm by having a border protection. Well, absolutely, what I would say, and I'll, I'll let others um, address it as well, is I think most of our partners to the south of us, whether it's Mexico or Central America, are saying, why, why is the U.S. not doing more to secure its border, to stop this flow, right? We all have a, a, a responsibility. It's a partnership to stop the illegal immigration that we see today. And as they, as they look north to the United States and they see almost nothing is being done along that border to actually deter it, they are less incentivized to actually take steps in their, in their own country. To address your first concern, yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say most individuals along that journey, again, everyone crosses that border at the hands of a cartel member. Um, and they are uh, subject to all sorts of abuse. Uh, during my time um, at DHS, we gave most females crossing the border over the age nine or 10 a pregnancy test. Uh, for obvious reasons, we had to understand what we were dealing with. And so that gives you an idea of the the depravity and, and the situation that a lot of these uh, migrants subject themselves to in the hands of cartels. So the most humane policy, I would say, is to prevent that type of, of transit and transportation and the flow to begin with. Thank you so very much. We'll back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. And Mr. Wolf, uh, during your time in the Trump administration at DHS, you oversaw the design and implementation of the monstrous and cruel family separation policy, tearing children away from their families, many of whom are yet to be reunited with their parents. Here are a few examples of those kids that you ripped from their families. You've suppressed a DHS report about the dangers of white supremacy. Your tenure at DHS was marred with significant ethical and legal concerns. 
Your communications during January 6 mysteriously disappeared. And there are serious ethical questions about your relationship with a lobbying firm. You explicitly defied congressional subpoenas to testify in front of the then Democratic Congress, yet you've shown up today voluntarily, yet feel comfortable testifying here today. Federal courts even rule that your tenure as quote unquote acting secretary of DHS was illegal. In your testimony, you've described many of President Biden's efforts as quote unquote illegal. But I find it ironic that we should trust you on what is lawful given your extensive disregard for American law. So let's discuss one of those egregious policies you implemented that was eventually struck down by American courts. Mr. Wolf, you were one of the key architects of the Trump administration's efforts to separate families at the border. Children as young as four months were mercilessly taken from their parents, with almost 1,000 children still not reunited with their families years later, even though the Biden administration set up a task force to reunite them. I'm a father of three kids, a nine-year-old daughter, a seven-year-old son, and an 18-month-old daughter. Do you have kids, Mr. Wolf? I do. What you did is inimaginable, unimaginable, inhumane, and despicable. And I'm quite frankly, I'm surprised the chairman invited you to be here today. Yet earlier this week, when you were asked about revisiting family separations, you said that, quote, all options need to be on the table. As we all know, we're having an important debate about immigration in the Congress and for the presidency. So I'd like to ask you an important question. I'd like a yes or no answer. I'd like you to be a straight shooter. You are from Texas, after all. Would you advise this or a future administration to once again separate families as the Trump administration did? So I'll stand by my statement that you, I think, quoted earlier that all options should be on the table. But what I would say is that there are a number of effective programs, including MPP and others that I'm sure we'll talk about that address the situation along that border. And the crisis that we faced in 18 is very different than the crisis right, that we face you. today. So that means that you do think that it should be considered and possibly used? That's, so that's not my more, response. For the record here, I'll remind you, Mr. Wolf, that what you did is inhumane. And I'll be requesting that the Biden administration release all documents related to family separation policy, and we'll settle the matter once and for all on your involvement in that policy. I also want to ask you another important question. It's often the case that folks who give testimony before Congress, folks who served in one administration, if there is a second administration, they will often serve again. That's true for Democrats and Republicans. There's a chance that if President Trump is elected to office, that you might be considered to serve in the administration again, regardless of what my opinion or the opinion of others here may be of you. So, Mr. Wolf, do you, you, you or your organization support the use of military force in Mexico, even without the consent of the Mexican government, as many leading Republican officials have called for? I've been on record as supporting uh, all hands or all options should be on the table when we look at so that's the yes. threat of cartels and the violence against Americans. So you might counsel a yes. I think all options should be considered. This idea of taking options off the table for a variety of different right. policy Thank issues you. that me, we have addressed, it, it makes you've no done, sense. You've and I should say all the other things that you leveled against me Mr. Ward, are all just you, absurd you, on their face. You, listen, your, I'm your happy America to address any of those. Policy Institute is closely related with President Trump. So I just have one final question for you and your colleague, if you wish to answer it. Uh, what happens to the America, policy, America First Policy Institute if President Trump goes to prison? The America First Policy Institute will continue to be around for hundreds of years. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Chairman Mike McCall. And we appreciate the witnesses being here today. Especially, I want to thank uh, Secretary Wolf. Uh, you've made a difference on behalf of our country protecting American families. Uh, and the more that you're attacked, the clearer your success has been. So uh, thank you for the inadvertent um, uh, attack on you, which uh, really proves uh, that you're making a difference to protect American families, which is the main thing that we should be doing here 
uh, to avoid uh, future attacks on our country. And I'm really grateful for the leadership of Chairman Mike McCall. Uh, he uh, is obviously passionate uh, about his concern. This is not political in holding the hearing today about the security threat of the Biden open border. In fact, I agree with Alabama Se Senator Tommy Turbeville. He stated two days ago that uh, America is going to be subject to 9-11 attacks imminent, quote, every few days across America due to Biden's open border of terrorism. I also would take it a step further. Each one of our congressional offices, we have a rally point where if there's an attack or uh, any other event that would require uh, safety for our personnel, uh, there's a rally point. And I would urge every American family uh, that they should also have a rally point. Uh, with the open borders that we have, every American family uh, is subject to risk, and they should have a rally point where they come uh, to be uh, safely protected, uh, that uh, if communications is interrupted, which it will be uh, by the sophisticated terrorists who are in our country, uh, that they should have a place uh, to come uh, so that you would have accountability for your family. America has a long tradition of welcoming legal immigrants and petitioners with legal asylum claims who seek to pursue the American dream and escape oppression legally. What we're seeing today is an insane, dangerous, deliberate mass flooding of the southern border with trafficking of children and deadly drugs like fentanyl, which is enriching the cartels. When I visited the southern border, I was told that they could not tell me how many people on the terrorist watch list had crossed. We now know with the fiscal year 2023 20, uh, that Customs and Border Patrol have identified 151 persons or terrorists who have come across into our country. These are highly educated, well-paid, hard-working, skilled mass murderers. Uh, we know that the President himself has said that all it takes is one lone wolf. Uh, we know that the New York Post has reported the American families are at greater risk today than they ever have been since 9-11. And the thought that we would have people here uh, not understanding this uh, is just inconceivable uh, and uh, a different planet from where we sadly are today. We know that the war criminal Putin, the Chinese Communist Party, the Iranian regime have significantly increased their presence in Latin America. For example, the Iranian regime through terrorist puppets work with the cartels to tra traffic drug. And as President Donald Trump has rightfully stated, quote, fuel the fires of sectarian conflict and violence. Secretary Wolf, we're at a high risk of a terrorist attack in America. What is your view of the importance of addressing the influence and network of the dictators, war criminal Putin, the Chinese Communist Party, the regime in Iran, to protect American families? I would say that the, the security of the homeland starts obviously overseas uh, in, on a variety of all the, all the instances that you just said. DHS works uh, with the Departments of State, Defense, and others to help protect Americans here at home by first making sure the threat never reaches the homeland. So yes, you have to address all of the above and more, but at the end of the day, you need to have some sovereignty over your borders, uh, and you need to understand who's coming into the country. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Isaacson, the largest number of Russian GRU uh, secret police agents in the world are in Mexico. Putin's fellow KGB agent and top spy, Nikolai Petrushev, established and cultivated Russian outposts in Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Nicaragua, and Mexico. They provide the weapons to dictators like Maduro. Mr. Isaacson, what should we do to stop uh, uh, Putin's efforts in Latin America? To stop Putin's efforts in Latin America, really, it's a good effort with intelligence and and you know and, and making sure that those arms sales and other things don't go unresponded to. In, at the border, you do have a lot of Russian people coming now. We have to sort out. I think nearly all of them, maybe all of them, are trying not to be recruited by Putin. And, and I, I need to conclude, but I agree with you. They, I was told by the border guards there is high, high number and uh, large number of Russians and Chinese coming. In my era, that meant defectors. That's not what it is today. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman Yale's chair recognizes Mr. Phyllis McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a line of questions. In your testimony to, I believe it was Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Wolf, Hamilton specifically said that most of the people coming to the border were opportunists. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. 
Okay, so I wanted to talk to you about the parole program also. Um, my, this situation and this hearing is personal to me, being one of the only Haitian Americans um, in Congress. In addition to that, I wanted to give you some description of the people you call opportunists. We recently had a hearing in September where we had people from Haiti actually talk about the circumstances. There was a mother there who talked about how, as she was taking her daughter to school, she saw over 50 people who were lynched, hanging from trees. And so she wanted to come to the United States. Is she an opportunist? Yes. She's an opportunist fleeing from destruction and terrorism in the country. You consider her an opportunist? The, unless she, you're describing a person who was targeted by the government of Haiti. Are you aware that right now being persecuted are you aware on account of, of a political are you aware opinion right or any now kind of anything is, else? So she's excuse not me, eligible I'm, I'm for claiming, a I'm claiming my time. Thank you very much, sir. Um, are you aware of the state of the government in Haiti, that there really is no government right now, and that the gangs are actually taking over the country? I'm, yes or no? I am quite aware okay, of Okay, thank you. So my next question Haiti. is, there's a father also whose entire family was kidnapped, and he watched his daughter and his wife get raped repeatedly by over 50 men, and they too went through the parole program and came into the United States. Are they opportunists? Yes. Under your circumstance, they're opportunists? Yes. Okay, my next question is, when my parents were fleeing a dictator, on my mother's way to school, she saw them hanging children and shooting them in front of her. Was my mother who fleed the dictator an uh, opportunist? Well, now that's the difference, is because in that description, you just said that your mother was fleeing a dictator. And so, no, your mother was not an opportunist. Right now, the Your mother sounds okay, like she was excuse fleeing. Excuse me, sir, well, right now. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to give you an answer. Uh, no, your answer She's was sufficient. She's fleeing political excuse me, sir, your time, which means your time. that she actually qualifies so as I mentioned, for asylum under I'm claiming my time, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very so much. So what I want to explain to you is that right now, with the state of Haiti and how it is right now with no government and the gangs are actually running the country, there is no difference between the dictator and the, what they're suffering now. So I just wanted to make sure that these assumptions that you're making and trying to say that they're opportunists and saying that the Biden administration is actually abusing its humanitarian parole privileges are actually false. And the fact that you cannot see that these people actually need help and that they do deserve humanitarian parole just shows the cruelty of your heart and you not understanding what our greatness and our strength is as Americans. And so I wanted to go back to another question which I had for you also. Um, I was looking at your background. Could you please talk about your diplomacy experience that you've had? The diplomacy experience I've had? Yes, because in our committee, we actually have jurisdiction when it comes to diplomacy. So I would like to hear more about your diplomacy experience so we could talk about how we can treat the root causes because your testimony is really focused on opportunist and negative ideas. And even, I wanted to ask you also, do you believe these people who are coming in under the parole program? And it's not just Haiti. If we're looking at Venezuela, Nicaragua, and also Cuba, they have the similar situations where it's un they can't exist in these countries. So I wanted to know what what was your diplomatic um, experience? Because you mentioned something that was interesting. You said that these young people are coming because the door is open, and that's what's leaving, leading the economy of these countries to lean on China. And so, you know, from a diplomatic standpoint, it doesn't make sense. So I want you to go into the full detail of your diplomatic experience. Well, I would say that uh, over the course of uh, four years during the Trump administration, I was engaged in many discussions with many foreign partners, including international travel to several of these different countries that we're talking about today, including Haiti. So I don't know what kind of experience you think that I need to have, because quite frankly, well, the diplomatic I am experience an American that I was looking citizen for was one testifying about American laws and the Excuse effect me, on Excuse our me, country. Sir. Once again, I wanted to make sure that your, your testimony and the assertions you're making about diplomacy, right, and saying that these are the root causes, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So I wanted to get back to my last question actually is going to be for Mr. Isaacson. Can we talk about what would happen with the removal of the parole program? What would happen? If the parole program is removed, um, you'll see 30,000 more people who do not qualify for it. A large number of them are in some danger and will try to seek asylum by coming all the way to the U.S.-Mexico border. And so do you believe that removal of the parole program would actually exacerbate what we have at the border or would it um, preclude people from coming to the border. No, when the parole program went into effect, um, the number of people from Haiti, Nicaragua, and Cuba in particular plummeted. Venezuela did for a while. And yeah, you would see a reversal of that. Thank you so much. I yield back. Only yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Perry. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Secretary Wolf, do you know how many children have been lost in the United States uh, in the last three years by the Biden administration? Uh, I can go by a number that I believe was reported in the New York Times where they talked about uh, losing over 85,000 unaccompanied alien children. Yeah, 85 to 100,000 un unaccompanied alien children in our country lost by this administration. Do you think that's humane or inhumane? It's extremely inhumane. Do you think that any of them have been placed with sex traffickers in this country? 85 to 100,000 unaccompanied minors that came across the border illegally? I don't have any data, but my experience tells me that, yes, they have been. Is that humane or inhumane? It's inhumane. Do the cartels ever separate children from their families? Every day. Humane or inhumane? Inhumane. Little girls being raped on the way through Mexico to the border. Little boys being raped and sold into sex slavery. Humane or inhumane? Very inhumane. And yet these are all the policies of the current administration. Do you know what they're doing to find these 100,000 kids that they have lost? I don't. Obviously, they don't talk to me. Uh, but I would assume that once these children are released to sponsors and they are out of ORR custody, um, they, they're, they're gone. Um, ORR does not track where they go. Uh, they know which household they have released them to. Uh, but they're not required to stay in that state or city, and so they can go anywhere in the country and elsewhere. Do you know of any other civilized country on the nation whose government is part of a human trafficking scheme at that scale? I know of no other country that treats their border and the policies associated with the border in the manner in which we do. I would agree with you, Secretary, and it is staggering to us to hear these statistics, to know that our tax dollars pay for the sex trafficking of children in our country. And it's my understanding that, unfortunately, America is number one or two, the number one or two target on the planet for child sex trafficking. And yet we have a wide open border offered by this administration and this president and the party that supports him. Mr. Isaacson. You talked about um, folks coming from Pakistan, China, and Russia, and I would agree with you. I've been on the border, and I've seen people from Pakistan, China, and Russia when I've been there. Would you say that all of them are fearing their lives, fearing for their lives, and that's why they've come to America? These are authoritarian countries. Uh, many are fearing for their lives, yeah. Many or all? Pretty much all, but it's up Pretty to much our all. immigration Pretty much all. Let me ask you out. this. Pakistan, Russia, even China, are there any countries between here and there that are more safe than Pakistan, China, or Russia? There are some, and there are some that are not. Which ones are not? I would say Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. No, no, I said Pakistan, China, or Russia. They all take a path through Ecuador and go up the land. But is there any country between those countries and this country that would be safer than the country they flee, according to you, every single one of them fearing for their lives. Like in the Pacific Ocean somewhere? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry? Like in the Pacific Ocean somewhere? I don't think I understand There's the no island in the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. Indonesia, maybe. Right. Japan. No, no place on the planet that they can get to before crossing the Pacific Ocean to get to the United States of America. Many probably wouldn't want to, but Ecuador is, and to some extent, Many Brazil Many wouldn't are want to. Why wouldn't they want to? Because they'd rather be someplace where there's more familiar okay, culture, more that's familiar That's awesome. Yeah. Do, is there any reason at all that you can think of that a country should have a border? Sure. Uh, what would the reason be? Countries have different legal systems, different ways of, of governing. So just yeah. to have a different legal system. But other than that, there should be no border in any country around the globe. Like people in Mexico or people in Russia, China, for that matter, could elect the president of the United States because there's no border, right? No, I said it's a different legal system. So there are different legal different systems. What, is there any other purpose for having a border? Is there another different purpose for having a country? What? what yeah. Okay. You I mean, answered you, the question. You, I think it's a great question. Are you an or are you a bunch of people that has shares a bunch of common values and and, and a legal system that that cements so the when, into place? So when when people that are that are not abiding by the law from another country come illegally to this country, that has a different that is a country because of a different set of laws. 
You're good with that. If it's asylum, they're not coming illegally. And if it's, maybe they if want it's to asylum, but you said it's law. all asylum, didn't you? It's all asylum because well, they're all Well, that's up for our immigration for courts to decide whether they get asylum or not. Mr. Chairman, I yield. No one yields. Chairman recognizes Mr. Stanton. Dean. No, you're the last. Dean. <laughs> Dean. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Dean. Dean. Miss Dean. Miss Dean. Miss Dean. I need some help. Oh up here, my man. lord, Chairman. I need my someone God. else. I, I think you're having the same experience that I'm having. I feel a little out of body in this conversation. So I don't blame you for calling me Stanton or Mr. Dean. I was gonna say uh, sometimes I go by Mr. Dean. Uh, I have a brother, Jimmy Dean. I'm trying to lighten the mood because uh, I'm looking around this room. Honest to God, didn't every single one of us come here as an immigrant somewhere in our past? Isn't it possible that every single one of us has an immigrant past? And yet, we hear a conversation here from two of this panel who like to talk about illegal aliens. They're human beings seeking refuge very, 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 very often. And the numbers are staggering. We can agree upon that. But if we want to solve a problem, why don't we tell the truth about it instead of demonizing those who are seeking refuge in this country? Let's stop the lie about fentanyl and the illegal aliens bringing fentanyl. Again, fentanyl is a serious problem in this country. The cartels are bringing it in. We know the precursors are coming from China to the cartels. Let's deal with that problem seriously. They're not coming in in the backpacks and the hand sacks of migrants desperately fleeing persecution, economic uh, deprivation, starvation, and other things. I ask you, gentlemen, in particular, the two who served in the previous administration, speak with humanity. Mr. Wolf, nothing's off the table. The separation of children under the previous administration that you were a primary architect of, not off the table in the future? Well, what I would say, again, I answer that, happy to answer it again. Not off the table. You just called it. What, what I said earlier was that I think there are a number of different policies and programs I'm that, we put in place policy. that we put in place after 2018. Look, Mr. I Wolf, get it that Mr. most Wolf, folks want to talk about me, four Wolf, weeks that Mr. happened Wolf, in 2018. I own the time. Answer the question as posed. I've answered Will that several times. All options should be on the table when you're trying to find and solutions to a problem. And you just called the separation of children inhumane but when what somebody I would else say did it. Mr. Is Wolf, that a has, number of other policies, including MPP, me. Excuse are very, me. very effective Ms. to address the issue. Mr. Chairman, would you please restore some Trying time to answer for the me? Question. All right, order, let's have order. Ms. I asked for a restoration Ms. of 20 seconds. He talked right. over I'll, me. I will Sorry. restore you 20 seconds. Thank then. you. Then you may continue. Mr. Wolf, are you and the previous members of the administration doing everything in your power to get those 1,000 children separated from their parents years ago back to their families? We are doing everything in our power what to address- What have you done? to address the current situation over the last three years where we've had over 500,000 no, children come across. you've done nothing over the across. disaster that you, so, the inhumane I'm disaster. sorry if, you I'm know, most of now, the members of this committee I don't want to talk about 85,000 children that have been lost I, over three years. When I said I was moving on, I meant it. I am surprised that you are the two who are testifying here today. So let me go on to Mr. Isaacson. I wholeheartedly concur with your assertion, assertion that asylum is necessary. It's an important American value. Can you get at, quickly, I know I have very little time, some of the root causes of why we are seeing such a spike in numbers? This is not a, a problem that is under one administration. We've seen high numbers over the years, but certainly under the last three years, we have higher numbers. What are the root causes? Yeah, we, often when you talk to somebody, they'll give you more than one reason, but those reasons are authoritarianism, violence, targeted violence often, or violence that governments can't protect people from. Um, sometimes it's discrimination. Sometimes it's sexual or gender-based violence. Um, quite often, more recently, it's, uh, it, it's natural disasters often caused by climate change. And sometimes and in just what plain countries? poverty. What countries are we talking about? After all, we are the Foreign Affairs Committee. This is not all just people sitting on the border. Yeah, about, about a quarter are coming from Mexico. 
Another third or so are coming from Central America. Um, another third or so are coming from South America. And the rest, uh, about 15% and growing, are coming from outside this hemisphere. Yes, and can you talk to that issue? those coming from outside the hemisphere. Sure, I mean, the opening of the Dadian Gap route has made it possible for more people to come by land. Um, they are coming to countries, usually in South America, that have looser visa restrictions. That's why they come there instead of to Indonesia or Japan. Um, and then they make this incredibly long journey all the way up to the U.S.-Mexico border to, to ask for asylum. I thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, I am dismayed. This is a very serious problem. The border is a serious problem. We need to put more resources there. But we need to do it with humanity and understanding of what people are seeking and what rights they actually have. Everybody crossing the border is not an illegal, nor is he or she an alien. And I yield back. General Lee yields back, and Ms. Wagner is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for their uh, expertise. Uh, you know, I, I, I find this, some of this conversation absurd also. Um, we're talking about a thousand children. We're talking about a period of time of three to four weeks. Well, I know the last administration was working out protocols to keep families together. Yet, we have an administration now that has lost 85 to 100,000 children to cartels and trafficking and gangs and sex uh, exploitation. Um, and uh, it's, it's just incompatible to me. So, Secretary Wolf, I, I agree. And I, let me reiterate, Secretary Wolf, and I am sorry that you were politically and personally attacked and that one of my colleagues had the nerve to even bring your children into it. I apologize to you, sir. Thank you. Um, let me just say I agree that this crisis is not a funding problem. It is a policy problem. Uh, and it's a huge national security risk. And it's a huge human uh, humanitarian atrocity. Earlier this year, this committee advanced legislation to codify the previous administration's migrant protection programs and the asylum cooperative agreements. These policies worked because they required migrants and asylum seekers to follow the law, to remain in Mexico for the first safe or the first safe country while their claims were pending. Do you believe that codifying MPP? and ACA into law as opposed to the executive order that was used before could make a significant impact in addressing illegal migration um, crises that's at our southern border. Well, absolutely. Codifying the ACAs or the asylum cooperative agreements I think is a good step forward. MPP is already in law, uh, so you can certainly mandate it uh, because it is an option right now. Uh, so I think both of those together are very, very important programs. And to that point, I'd say, sir, Secretary um, and Mr. Hamilton, per the, uh, uh, the CBP's website, believe it or not, the current administration is still using MPP. Listen to this, although at a much, much smaller scale. Its data shows that 147 migrants were returned to Mexico through MPP last month. Are you surprised at the data indicating the continued use of MPP? And why would the administration keep quiet about their use of the program and not expand it as we did in the last, humanitarily expand it as we did in the last administration? We're talking about 7.5 million encounters at the border, 1.8 million minimum gotaways, and some 300,000 known terrorists. Explain, can you explain that to well, me? I believe they're, they're mandated to continue remain in Mexico or MPP. They're doing it such a small number by a court. They're doing it in such small numbers that it, it's virtually ineffective. It's an ineffective program. Correct. Because you have to do it across the board because the cartels know where you're doing it, where you're not doing it, and will adjust their, their procedures accordingly. I think just to, sorry, just to take two seconds here, this idea that we're somehow against immigrants is just a falsity. Absurd. We, we are the most we, welcoming. We nationalize a, a million a year, a million a year that come here legally, yeah. as my ancestors did. So I just wanted to be clear on that. We are the most welcoming nation, and we will continue to be. This is about illegal activity. Correct. And if, and if certain members want to excuse the illegal activity, uh, I just would say I'm not going to be a part of that. Let me just go on. Uh, 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 we have obviously a full-blown humanitarian crisis. It's unfolded here, uh, resulting in an explosion in deadly fentanyl trafficking. And it is coming in via cartels and those that are being 
uh, uh, trafficked through our borders, okay? Human trafficking, rampant violence against women and children. The Biden administration's policy blunders are directly responsible for this tragic and out of control situation. You know, I recently read a report in which the regional director for Latin America from the International Coalition Against Trafficking in Women stated that up to 60% of Latin American children attempting to cross our southern border are caught by cartels and then exploited in child sexual abuse material, also known as child pornography. This is heartbreaking and is utterly um, unacceptable. Mr. Wolf, based on your experience leading the Department of Homeland Security as secretary, can you speak to the dangers of sexual violence, particularly facing children during the trek to our southern border? Well, absolutely. They're subjected to any number uh, of abuse, rape, uh, worse, murder. Uh, the journey that they embark on uh, is one that, you know, it, it's incomprehensible. And so the idea during the Trump administration, and I think what most Americans would agree with, is let's not subject those children or individuals or adults or any, really anyone to that dangerous journey. Absolutely. Let's make sure that we give them the protections if they truly need it closest to home. I thank you. I thank you for your service. I thank you for the sacrifice of your families and others and for saving others here in, in America. As my friend uh, Mr. Wilson said earlier, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired and I yield back. Generally yields. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Isaacson, I want you to speak into that microphone. We want to hear you as loud as the two gentlemen on your right have been. Uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Isaacson, why do people come here illegally? I mean, why not just go through the system like apparently Ms. Wagner's relatives did and be right with the Lord and everything's hunky-dory? Why, why do people come here illegally? Well, I mean, for a few reasons, obviously. I mean, if you're coming illegally, which means you're not even asking for asylum, you just want to come here and start working, uh, that would be it. It's probably poverty, and it's likely that our laws from the 1990s have not changed um, to make uh, citizenship or residency or work permits more available to you. So one of the programs that was created to deal with the border situation was Remain in Mexico. Is that right? Apparently, yes. And if you're seeking asylum, which is a special category in immigration, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it and historically receives a certain respect, right? Certain protocols are triggered when someone appeals for asylum. Correct, and you should get due process. You're not just any immigrant. You're in a special category. So people who were subjected to remain in Mexico seeking asylum, what percentage of those people uh, were adjudicated in that program, do you know, uh, seeking asylum? Yeah, I mean, they were all asylum seekers. Uh, roughly half got to court, and only 2%, which is far less in the regular immigration courts, only 2% were able to get protection. Did you say 2%? Your approval rate was about 2%. Well, that doesn't sound successful. Uh, certainly not for the asylum seekers, it wasn't. Well, in whose administration did this Remain in Mexico program get started? It was uh, the middle of 2019, Donald Trump's administration. Oh, oh, got a failure on our hands in the Trump administration. Okay, well, let's pick one that was successful. If you remember in the 2016 campaign, that same individual who became president, uh, we recognize election results on this side of the aisle, uh, he <laughs> promised two things. We're going to build a wall, and who's going to pay for it? Mexico. Yeah, he would even get audiences to answer that question. So, how much of the wall, we got a 1,954 mile border, how much of the wall got built, do you know? Uh, all, all told, including replacements and others, Trump, I want to say about 600 miles of, of fencing. Hmm. And who paid for it? Uh, the United States taxpayer. Not Mexico? Not a peso. Another failure. Of which administration, again, remind me? <laughs> the Trump administration. Trump administration. Hmm. So, Mr. Wolf has said everything is on the table with respect to addressing the border. Do you hear him say that? Yes, and I saw the quote in the media. Now, we've actually had some Republican candidates running for president who have included in that category, at least for them, I don't know if Mr. Wolf would include it, and I'm not asking him because I have little time, Let's invade Mexico. 
We can do something about cartels. We can do something about crime. We can do something about illegal immigration crossing the border. Um, do you think that would be a wise policy to invade Mes Mexico? Absolutely not. not Why not? Well, I mean, first of all, we go against the will of a sovereign country, but second, we've taken yeah, down but, cartels but for years. We want everything years, on the table, don't we? I mean, I guess that would be on the table always, but I don't know what purpose it would serve having that on the table. Hmm. What about what about putting kids in cages? <laughs> How about that? Uh, that has not proven to, be, to deter kids from coming, that's for sure, and of course it's cruel. So, but presumably, if we're going to have everything on the table, like we did in which administration were kids put in cages? <laughs> the Trump administration. Ah, another success story. Okay, but if we're going to do put everything on the table, should that be on no, the? No, you're right. You're right. Actually. Should that be on the table? Um, I do not think that would ever uh, be on the table. Detention of children should not be on the table. Why? We are not a country that sees itself as a country that that puts kids in in, in prisons. They're, ah. Kids should be in proper settings. So you're actually telling us that we've got values we should be honoring as we deal with any kind of situation on the border. It's what makes us a democratic nation. I thank you. I yield back. Uh, chairman recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Connolly, I hope you stick around for a minute. Do, should I understand? Mass, I'm not here for your pleasure or enjoyment. I have, an, I have a schedule to keep. You rarely Thank you. offer me pleasure and enjoyment. I would agree well, with you. Well, and, and so, I assure you the feeling is mutual, Mr. Mass. This goes to you and Mr. Isaacson and your conversation just now. Should I understand from your questioning that any mile not built you consider a failure? Any mile of wall not built you consider would, a failure? Would you repeat the question? You want me to answer? Yeah, I'd be glad I, to. Would you repeat I, the question? I, whenever I ask questions, I do always give you guys time to answer, so I'll, I'll ask it again. Uh, based upon the way I heard you asking questions, any mile of wall that was not built, would you consider that a failure? I consider the fact that a presidential candidate campaigned on the issue of I will build a wall that covers the entire border of the United States with Mexico, and the Mexicans will pay for it. I heard and he you're got, talking and he got rallies, already. And but he got rallies to answer that. Mile of wall yes, not built I consider a that an abject failure. And I consider it a, a mile job, of wall not built as a and failure. And I consider it a con job on the American people. Do you think we should build every single mile of wall? Should we build every single mile of wall? I, I don't think it's practical, and I don't think it will work. I think it shows how little you know about physical security. Well, I don't think it's your business to be speculating on what I know and don't know, Mr. Mast. It's my business, physical security, being on why don't one you side stick, of a wall Why don't you another. stick to what you know as opposed to what I know? I can speak to what you know. I can speak to what it appears that you know. I well, we all can. You're good at throwing insults. I know you, I've seen it with Mr. Meeks. It's not an insult. It's fact. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I thought... Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I thought I was being asked questions and of course and, and being able to answer. And does the gentleman uh, from Florida yes. yield to the gentleman from I, Virginia? I did, but I'm going to move back to the panel now. Oh. I, I thought it was interesting. I thought maybe it was a, a point of agreement that any mile of wall not yet built is a failure, that we should get to every single mile of wall being built because physical security does matter. Does it mean somebody's not going to try to jump it or burrow under it or cut through it or go around it in some, or some other kind of way? Sure, somebody's going to try to do that. But as somebody that's been on a wall in Afghanistan and other places, I can tell you that it certainly makes a, a damn good amount of difference that that wall is there. How tall it is, how, how, how much of an area it encompasses, you name it, it makes a huge amount of difference. And so I thought it you know, could have been a point of bipartisanness. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, I want to ask you a question. Uh, your testimony was interesting, and the testimony of everybody was interesting. You said this is not the border situation the U.S. government prepared for. Expand a little bit. Absolutely. Um, you know, in the 1990s and after 9-11, we built up a border infrastructure designed for Mexican males or potential terrorists. And now, two-thirds of who are coming are people asking for asylum and are often families and children. And I think the numbers bear that out. I don't think you're saying something that's, that's not true in there. And I think when we layer it upon things that, you know, the other, the other panelists have said, I think it works very well to say, okay, we have a situation that wasn't prepared for, but are we going to follow the law or are we not going to follow the law? Do words have meaning or do words not have meaning? Are, are we going to say that somebody is granted asylum because we're going to not define the word humane or inhumane and just say, well, if there was meanness in your country, 
then you're allowed in. Or if there was uh, poverty in your country, that constitutes a credible threat to life, so you're going to be allowed in. Or if there, you used the word the intimidation in, in earlier questioning, said there was intimidation. If there's intimidation, does that constitute a credible threat to life? And the, the fact of the matter is, the situation at the border is not what we prepared for because we're allowing people in under definitions that don't met, don't meet what we prepared for. We prepared for an actual credible threat to life. Mm -hmm. And we've moved to a situation where everybody that makes a complaint about their country and is unwilling to look at a different city in their country, a different territory in their country, an adjacent country to them, because they're unwilling to look at that, will say, well, it must have been a credible threat to life. And I'm going to give the last word to the other panelists here to just simply talk about what you see in terms of the, the lack of truly looking at the word of the law and the word of the law that we must follow as a United States government. Well, thank you for that important question. Uh, this Congress has the ability to change those laws. If it doesn't like the laws, if it doesn't like the grounds on which someone can be granted asylum, it can certainly change them if they want to. But doing so would be, would be a, I think, a, a serious uh, problem uh, to cover all of those areas because we cannot become the place for everyone across the world to come to this one country. God made a wonderful world. It has a lot of great places across it. We cannot be the only place in the entire world where every single person who wants more money or better protection from crime comes to the United States to be saved. What I would say is that one of the other things that is critically important about this entire situation is that, factually speaking, right now at the border, these people, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, of aliens crossing the border are not even being subjected or assessed for credible fear screenings. They're not even testing if these people have an asylum claim. They're just issuing court papers and letting them go. Out of, I think yesterday, there was something like 9,400 crossings at the border. And out of that 9,400, preliminary reporting indicates at least 5,200 of them were just given paperwork to go show up in court someday. This is a, a significant and serious problem. The administration is not even assessing these people for any potential asylum claims. They're just letting them. Gentlemen's time's expired. We have a uh, vote coming up in five minutes, and we have a lot of members. So in fairness, I, you know, uh, I'm going to have to limit the members to two minutes, which, you know, I apologize. This has been a very great uh, avid discussion, but I want to make sure I get in as many people as I can. Um, so the gentleman uh, from Mr. Keating is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Wolf. Uh, American First Policy Institute, sounds pretty good to me. Uh, you're the executive director? I've got two minutes, please. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am, sorry, yes. Uh, uh, Chief Strategy Officer, uh, who would that, would that be you? Yes. Chair, that's you too. Of, you know, the, of the Homeland Security and Immigration fair, fair Center. Fair to say you know a lot about this institute. So tell me who pays your salary? About uh, $20 million at least that you've got. So you should know in those positions, where's the money coming from? Uh, donors. <laughs> That's good. Who is the money coming from exactly? We have a number of donors. We have no, 40, we, have 44, we have 44,000. Will you not disclose? You're here credentialed in that capacity. Tell I, me who's paying you. And don't say donors. Tell me who. What organizations? Who's behind it? I know one of them is the Trump political PAC. Is that correct? Uh, that's incorrect. Well, that's been reported, so correct me. Give me the names. We have 44,000 individual All right, donors to AFPI. All right, so you're here credentialed. I've got two minutes, I'm sorry. I mean, you're here credentialed with a nice sounding name, and you're not telling us who's paying your salary, even though you have those positions. All right, number one, you're also credentialed because you're a former Secretary of Homeland Security. And let me clear the record on that and make sure everyone gets this, that you were appointed two courts have ruled, two courts that existed under the Trump administration ruled that you had that position illegally. So there's your credentials. Now let me say this. Your testimony today said that it's, it's okay for the United States to take military action, deploy young men and women, soldiers from the United States in Mexico, even though the Mexican government doesn't want them there. 
You also said it's okay. It's not my testimony. It, it absolutely was, sir. I was here and I listened okay. to it. Number two, Disagree. you said it's okay that the U.S. can separate children as they have in the past. Again, not mothers. my testimony. Put them in cages. That indeed, sir, was your testimony and that's a fact. Listen, I think our board is in crisis. Every hearing. I think we have to do something about it. I just hope the Senate, as <clears> we're negotiating, <throat> could come up with a bipartisan solution to really do something meaningful and not listen to failed. Let me ask a question of which I yield back, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the, the I passion. It's two minutes. Well, let's entertain this issue. There are a lot of members here. It's a very uh, vigorous debate. Are the witnesses, we have a vote until probably 5 o'clock. Uh, and I want to respect the witnesses' time. Do they have time to come back or remain here until after votes, at, at which time we could reconvene? I do. And Mr. Hamilton. Seeing as how I'm a fan of making people wait, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Keating, everybody will have five minutes. I will, I will yield three minutes. Thank you if we're back. And Mr. Chairman, I pre appreciate that. And if I'm not back that early, don't hold everyone else up, but I'll be around. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Chair now recognizes Mr. Burchett. Mr. Speaker, thank you, or Mr. Chairman. Um, quickly wasting my time here. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hamilton, does the Border Patrol have the authority to refuse to allow illegal crossings? Depending on the context in which you're speaking, at a port of entry, they certainly do. And certainly that's why they build in physical infrastructure is to prevent the illegal entry of aliens into the United okay. States, which is, of course is also a federal crime. Great. What legal authority does a state like Texas have to protect its border? Well, under current interpretations of, of various courts, uh, those authorities remain limited under uh, certainly Supreme Court's decision in Arizona. Um, under the Constitution, I think there's those who have different uh, thoughts about that. Okay. Mr. Wolf, Vice President Harris was put in charge of the border crisis by President Biden. What has she done? Um, little to nothing, in my opinion. What can you tell us about the trafficking of children across the southern border? Again, in this, uh, over the last 32, 33 months, we've had about 500,000 unaccompanied alien children being trafficked across that border. 500,000. That is a record number in the last almost three years. 500,000 in three years, do you say? Well, under three okay. years. Okay. If American companies invested in a country like Guatemala and created jobs there, would that help with the flow of migrants? Undoubtedly, yes. How is Secretary Mayorkas hiding illegal immigrants using the CBP-1 app? Well, again, a number of aliens are, are using that CBP app to come into the, into the country. They're waiting in northern Mexico, and we talk a lot about MPP, uh, but they have their version of MPP, which is using that CBP-1 app that you can only access in northern Mexico and then having to wait in northern Mexico to receive your appointment right. at a port of entry. Is Mayorkas fulfilling his constitutional duty? That is a negative, no, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Chairman, whatever. I uh, yield you the rest of my time. I'm reclaiming my time, which, is, which means nothing. Oh, Maria, I would like to yield the remainder of my time to Maria Salazar. I think I have about a minute and a half. Thank you very much, I'm Maria Salazar from the city of Miami, and I just want to say thank you, Congressman. I oh. just uh, want to say that we have the same goals. Um, I agree with sealing the border. I voted for H.R. 2, um, and I'm just like you, nauseated by the fact that kids are being trafficked. You know, those children belong to my community. I belong to the Hispanic minority, which is the largest minority in the country, so I'm with you. Biden has done a horrible, horrible job, right? So we are on the same page. My problem is that H.R. 2 which is the law that we passed, needs some teeth for it to become the law of the land. Do you agree with me? Do you think, Mr. Wolf, that H.R. 2 will become the law of the land? Do you think it could pass the Senate? It will be signed by President Biden. Yes or no? I think it would be a good step forward to securing the border. No, no. We, we understand that it would be fantastic. The problem is that there's something missing, which is what are we going to do 
with those 10 million people right. who are here and that we understand that under President Trump, who had an effective immigration policy, sir, I'm looking at you, sir, Mr. Yeah. Wolf, yeah. right? Uh, he, Mr. Trump deported uh, 8,000 illegals a year, but if we make the math, if we do the math, is we're talking about 10 million in land, so that's 123 years that we would need in order to deport everybody. So all I'm trying to do, and I repeat, I'm on your side, is try to really get something on the books so we can seal the border and stop having those kids being raped. What do you think we could do? I, I think Effectively. That I, yeah, I think the question here is, what do you do with the uh, number of individuals here in the United States do you deport them? Do you remove them? But stop right there. You... Yes. Okay. Let's try to deport them. We have tried that. But you know, am I right in saying that we don't have enough agents? Mr. Trump oh, tried it. Without a doubt, a challenge. Mr. Obama tried it. Every single president has tried it. And they are working on the fields in construction and hospitality. Do Am I correct? Am I rigorous in what I'm saying? It's been but a challenge, without a doubt. The Republicans should be the party. So the Dems will not call us a bunch of racists anymore, that we, they do not have the monopoly on compassion. We are compassionate too, because you are concerned about those kids yes. that speak and sound like me are being raped right now, correct? So right. don't you think that the Republicans should be the party that should be ahead, finding a solution so we can stop this and put some order at the border have stopped the asylum system being gamed because, you know, my people are gaming it every single day. Do, do, am I, do I make sense? Yes, Congressman. So then what do you think we should do as Republicans? Again, I think H.R. 2 is a good first step. I think there's a lot more that can be done to secure that border. I think as you deal with, and it's really an issue for Congress, as you deal with the individuals that are here illegally, you have to close the loopholes that continue to funnel more and more folks coming here illegally. Oh, I agree with you. Let's and so seal, part of no, that no, is let's HR seal the border. Let's seal it. I have presented a law called the Dignity Act, which does that. And burns time, at the uh, state the time child time sex expired. traffickers. Generally's time expired. Uh, Chair recognizes We want to burn at the stake the child sex traffickers. But how no is time Congress to expire. Needs to do it. Thank you. The chair recognizes Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't realize I was going to have a time before we left. I just want to go over a couple of things. We're going to close the border so that would stop kids from being raped. Well, many of them are being raped in their home countries. That's why they're leaving to come to the United States because it's so dangerous there. And you've got some statistics that show how to set, keep it staying in uh, Mexico has resulted in 1,544 cases of kidnap, rape, murder, torture, and assault. That doesn't sound like a very good policy uh, to me. And when you keep talking about children, what's the definition of children? Is it anybody under 21, or is it like five and six-year-old children? Who are these children that uh, y'all are talking about? And then I heard the statement that we are the only country in the world that people want to go to. That, well, this is, we're the only ones where uh, immigrants are coming. I would ask uh, who said that, the guy in the middle there, what uh, he thinks about all the uh, migration within Latin America. You're going from uh, El Salvador to other countries in Latin America. You're going from Peru to Argentina. You're going from Venezuela to a number of countries. How about those countries? How about all of the North African countries that are going to Europe? How about the people in Syria and Turkey who are going to Europe as guest workers? How about uh, all the people of former colonies in Africa who are going to Europe? We are not the only place where people are going. Now in this world, you've got climate change. You've got authoritarian regimes. You've got uh, cl ethnic cleansing. A lot of things are driving people out. And you have social media so people can see what these other countries have to offer. Of course they want that for their families. And on social media they can figure out perhaps how to get there and try to make that happen. 
But I, I will ask Mr. Wolf something. I saw that name, and I thought it looked familiar. And then when I got here and saw you, it dawned on me. I used to be, or I was on the Homeland Security Committee when you were the illegal acting director, and I'm still there now. We have talked about this border problem ad nauseum without coming up with any solutions. But one of the things, in addition to those Mr. Castro mentioned, as I recall, you wanted to get rid of the DACA program. Get, just do away with DACA. This is that program where children who were brought here by their parents uh, when they were little didn't even know that they were not here legally, went to school here, speak English as well as you do. Think, this is the only country they've ever known. You want to send them back. Well, now that's being going through the courts and leaving a lot of people in the shadows don't know what their future might hold. Uh, I would just ask you, you still think getting rid of the DACA program is a good idea? And maybe, Mr. Isaacson, you could just take some time to put some of this stuff in perspective for us. It has gotten totally out of hand. It's ridiculous. Uh, but you still think DACA, getting rid of DACA is a good idea? I, I think it's a good idea, Congresswoman, to follow the law and Court after court has said that the DACA program is illegal, and I have been on record saying that this is a solution for Congress to fix, and time and time again, Congress has punted on that and not addressing the DACA population. The latest court, though, in Texas did put, a, it's not allowing future DACA, but, but it's all over the place in a lot of different courts, but it's put a stay on sending the ones who are here home and taking away that DACA protection. I understand So don't that. just say the courts have said it's illegal. But it's they, ha they have nuanced. found it illegal. What much they, what they have said is I don't believe they don't have to I know you're send individuals that. back That's that are currently clear. enrolled. Uh, Ms. Could we please move on? Sure. If I, if I could take a minute to just talk about the children. I mean, a law that passed in 2008 signed by President Bush said that any kid from a non-contiguous country who comes unaccompanied gets brought into the United States if they're on U.S. soil and given an asylum process. They get placed with sponsors or family members and we're supposed to know where they are. Yes, I think the Biden administration has fallen down on tracking them. I think that not enough, they have not had enough resources. That goes back to my original point about we did not prepare our border for this sort of a, a, a reality. But often, a kid that's lost often means that they could be going to school in Fairfax County right now, but they've lost their phone number. And we don't have the resources, and we haven't bothered to hire the people to actually track everybody down, and that is a shame. But it's an administrative problem in most of these cases. But yeah, Hannah Dreyer at the New York Times has done some amazing reporting about how some of these kids have to work at night. They get, they get brought into child labor, often <coughs> legally with work permits, but still the conditions are terrible. Um, this is something that we have to look at, um, but it does not mean shutting down that in 2008 law that protects some very vulnerable kids here in the United States. Gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barr is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary Wolf. Uh, I want to uh, address this uh, issue that my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, seem to be uh, forgetting about the actual facts and circumstances related to the so-called uh, uh, family separation uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, during the Trump administration, when you served as acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, sure did, did the department have a blanket policy of separating families at the border? Uh, no, certainly not. Uh, again, I was acting secretary at the end of November throughout uh, no November 2019 throughout 2020. Uh, the zero tolerance policy uh, had concluded by then, but even if you go back, no, there was no policy on separating families. And, and did the department under the Trump administration have a responsibility to protect all minors in, in your custody? Absolutely. Uh, and if there was a reason to question the claimed familial relationship between the adult and child, uh, do you think it would be appropriate to detain those adults and children together? Uh, it, it is appropriate. Uh, to both detain families together and to separate a child from what is presumably their parent, but in many instances it's not because they are being trafficked. So even before the Trump administration and today in the Biden administration, they separate children that are at risk because the Border Patrol are doing their job and has ascertained that the, quote, parent or the adult that they have come over the border with is no long is not actually their parent. They're right. being trafficked. Yeah. So true, true or false? Uh, DHS uh, witnesses uh, constantly illegal aliens using children to pose as family units to gain entry into the United States. That's a hundred percent true. What we call what we saw during my time 
uh, we called it child recycling. We saw some of the same children being used to cross that border multiple times to get uh, the adults in, into the country. And so you, as secretary in the Trump administration, protected children by taking them away from child molesters. Is that correct? We certainly did that during the Trump administration. Uh, previous administrations have done that. The Biden administration continues to do that. Is it more likely that families would be separated by having an open border or by having a secure border? Be uh, less likely having a secure border. Yeah. So uh, let me let me ask you about uh, the success of the uh, uh, MPP Remain in Mexico policy over the course of the implementation of MPP. Uh, tell me about um, what you saw in terms of apprehensions at the southern border, encounters and apprehensions. Well, during the course of, of the life of MPP, certainly throughout FY19 uh, and a little bit into FY20 before COVID hit, we saw the number of illegal apprehensions reduce quite significantly, particularly as it relates to family units from the Northern Triangle, which was the driver behind the 2018 to 2019 crisis which is why we instituted MPP, and we saw those drive down upwards to 80%. 80%. So a border encounters with Central American families dropped 80% during the implementation of MPP. Is that right? That's correct. What, Remain in Mexico. Did the uh, Biden administration reverse the Remain in Mexico policy? They eliminated, they eliminated MPP. They eliminated MPP, and the fiscal years, the three fiscal years that correspond with the Biden administration are the three worst years of illegal alien border apprehension ever recorded. Is that because we don't have a Remain in Mexico policy anymore? It's not only because we don't have MPP or Remain in Mexico, it's because we don't have any enforcement policies along that border. We are sending the wrong message to the cartels, to the aliens, and to everyone else who wants to come to the country illegally. Yeah, Mr. Wolf, uh, more than 24,000 Chinese citizens have been apprehended crossing the U.S. border from Mexico in the past year. 24,000 Chinese uh, uh, citizens. This is more than in the preceding 10 years combined. Who are these individuals? Do we have any reason to believe the CCP is taking advantage of our open border? Not just the fentanyl, uh, but also these individuals and um, is there any reason to believe that the CCP's united front work is using the open border to infiltrate uh, the United States? I think we have to assume they are. This, this naivety that everyone's coming here for humanitarian protections and they're not here to do bad things to the United States, I get that. It makes sense if you've never worked in Border Patrol or DHS and you've just thought about this issue. But if you're on the line and you're down there and you're talking to the agents and you're understanding who they pick up, and the bad individuals that are coming into the country to harm Americans every day, absolutely, you have to assume, I don't have the data, I have not seen the intelligence, you have to assume that CP, the Communist Party of China is taking advantage of the situation along that border. Well, my time has expired, but I appreciate your service when you were here. The situation was far better with you leading the department. I yield. Gentleman yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I represent Arizona. Arizonans know all too well that the situation at the southern border is unsustainable. A record number of migrants have been apprehended in the Tucson sector at an unrelenting pace that has made Tucson the busiest sector in the country over the last five months. Agents in southern Arizona apprehended more than 15,000 people last week alone. I spoke earlier today with uh, CBP agents in the Tucson sector. Their message to me, the message to Congress is Additional resources cannot come quickly enough. They're triaging, leaving interior checkpoints unmanned and surging staff to deal with the influx of migrants. Officers who normally work at the ports of entry where most illicit fentanyl is smuggled through are being reassigned to help with migrant apprehensions. Without adequate staff, vehicle processings have been reduced at ports of entry, which is devastating to Arizona's cross-border economy. That's why for months I've been calling for more federal resources to support border communities. This administration has sent this Congress a request for more than $13 billion to hire 1,300 more Border Patrol agents, upgrade technology, and 1,000 more agents to catch illicit fentanyl, to hire 1,600 asylum officers, and almost 400 new immigration judge teams to quickly adjudicate asylum cases. 
all to ensure a safe, orderly, and humane border. And more than $1.4 billion of that would go to replenish the shelter and services program to help ease the burden on overstretched local partners. That would make a massive difference right now on the ground in Arizona. The majority, unfortunately, has yet to take up that critical request. Now, this hearing is entitled, quote, the U.S. border crisis and the American solution to an international problem, unquote. We know migration issues are not unique to the United States. Increased migration is a worldwide crisis in which human tragedy in a developing world is putting pressure on countries like ours. But managing our border effectively and humanely is a collective responsibility, Republicans and Democrats working together. Now, I believe the Trump administration did get it wrong. Their approach was inhumane and ultimately ineffective. Their draconian policies, caging kids, separating families, and their children did nothing to deter migrants from coming to our borders, and it harmed the federal government's long-term ability to process migrants through the system, creating enormous backlogs that we are still trying to climb out of. But business as usual is not working either. So first, this Congress must get the emergency resources that DHS has asked for and the CBP agents on the front lines desperately need. Then this body needs to get to work on real comprehensive immigration reform that secures our border once and for all, fully enforces our nation's immigration laws, reforms our deeply broken asylum system, and safeguards it from abuse, and addresses the root causes of migration from countries in Latin America. And while we do that, this, can, this committee cannot lose sight of how important our trade and economic relationships are with Mexico and Latin America. We can't afford to lose or ignore, ignore the enormous economic benefit they bring to the United States, particularly border states like mine of Arizona. It's going to take an all hands on deck, all of government approach, and I am ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work with our Republican colleagues. And I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle feel exactly the same, because the people most hurt by Washington's gridlock are those border communities, and they simply can't wait any longer. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Kim. May we, we may be Thank you, Chairman. This hearing is about crisis we're seeing at the border, so I want to talk about the crisis I deal with as I represent a district in Southern California that is so close to the southern border and is rearing from the fact that that uh, fentanyl is having on my community. The fentanyl crisis is taking over my state, and especially in Southern California that is so close to the Orange County, Riverside County, and Perrier County that I represent. So um, I just want you to give, take this into consideration. One in five youth deaths is related to fentanyl. And the fiscal year 2022, nearly two thirds of fentanyl that came across the southern border came through the ports of uh, San Diego, Imperial counties. Uh, fentanyl and other synthetic opioids are flooding through our southern border and have killed more than 100,000 Americans per year since 2021. So I want to talk about uh, Chairman Xi Jinping's recent visit to my state in San Francisco, and they talked about uh, fentanyl precursor, and they talked about maybe forming or establishing some sort of a, a working group, but as we know, the devil is in the details. So I, I'm, I'm still yet to see what's in that detail, what is that working group is gonna do? So what do you think this, um, this administration should be doing to stop the precursor from leaving China and ultimately entering the United States to kill Americans. And I want to address this uh, to Mr. Wall. Look, I think the, the current uh, discussions uh, between President Biden and, and President Xi, I think it's a, it's a good first step. The, I think what you said is important, which is the devil's in the details. Whether, whether China lives up to their promises that they made there, I have my suspicions highly doubtful. Um, what I will say is when we talk about fentanyl, we are talking about the cartels. And so this idea that I heard earlier, which is, no, nope, we can't go after the cartels, sorry. That just because it's going to continue the status quo. Look, we can either 
continue to admire this problem. We're going to continue to see 100,000 American deaths every single year, or we can get serious about it mm -hmm. and address the underlying issue of the cartels. Two, I, uh, ports of entry, I think it's very important. You need more technology there. It, it is false to say that all of the fentanyl is coming between ports of entry. It's where we have most of our agents. It's where we have most of our technology. So, of yeah. course, you're going to see data that says it comes through there. I have introduced Southern Border Strategy Act just but to do exactly that. But it also becomes that. between right. ports of entry as well. Um, so let me, you know, let's also talk about what uh, Chairman Xi Jinping said. Uh, he reportedly made the commitments that CCP would do more to crack down on the proliferation. But if you recall, in 2019, he made those same com uh, commitments when he banned the production, sale, and export of fentanyl precursors from China to Mexico. But then he abandoned his commitment when the former speaker made her trip to Taiwan. Um, I just want you to know that he's using my constituents as uh, bargaining chips in the broader geopolitical competition. We just cannot tolerate that behavior. Uh, so knowing what we know today, it is clear that we should not have trusted Chairman Xi's uh, commitment on fentanyl precursors back in 2019. And so do we have any reason to believe that he's going to keep his word today? I, I don't believe so. And I think it's important to remember over the last three to four years, Mexico has developed the capacity uh, to produce fentanyl on their own. And the cartels, it's a highly lucrative business, and they have invested a lot of money, time, and attention into this. So I think there's still work that China can do, uh, but simply stopping the precursors from China is not going to eliminate the fentanyl uh, coming into the United States. Can you explain how um, the current administration's bilateral relationship with Mexico is failing to combat uh, fentanyl? Well, I think it's failing on a number, of, a number of instances. Again, all of this, whether we talk about fentanyl, whether we talk about human trafficking, the illegal smuggling, it all stems from the cartels. And there's not, being, there's not enough being done by the government of Mexico when it comes to the cartels or to stop the illegal flow. I talked about it in my opening statement. You've got to put pressure on the government of Mexico. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are transactional in nature, at least that, that, that was my experience during the Trump administration. Uh, and you've got to push them to places that they're uncomfortable with. Simply sending diplomatic cables and asking them to do things is not going to serve the American people very well. Thank you. Uh, the latest time has expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Ambo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the recognition. This is my first committee hearing. Uh, it is great to be part of the prestigious House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, as the son of Liberian and Ghanaian immigrants, I look forward to bringing forth my unique background uh, to this committee during this important time for our nation uh, and our world. And it is with that perspective I, I look forward to helping shape uh, our nation's foreign policy. Uh, it is grounded in our values of defending freedom, championing economic opportunity, upholding human rights, and ensuring that the rule of law uh, is respected. I was impressed with how bipartisan this committee was during yesterday's uh, markup, my first one of those as well. I've heard about this committee's rich uh, bipartisan history. Unfortunately, today is a bit of a departure uh, from that, and I hope we can work towards finding solutions uh, on this critical issue. As a first-generation American, I know the importance of legal immigration uh, to our nation. Uh, I also know the importance of not vilifying those who seek a better life for themselves uh, and their family. And so instead of a serious inquiry around real immigration so solutions, uh, you know, we are in the context uh, we're in today with this hearing. Uh, the Biden administration launched a series of foreign policy initiatives to manage migration across the Western Hemisphere and has requested real funding to implement them. Uh, if this hearing was meant to be more meaningful, we would discuss the funding uh, of the president's budget request. We would invest in partnering with governments in the region to screen migrants and support uh, integration. We would fund operations to vet potential candidates for refugee resettlement or other legal methods of migration. 
Finally, the president's request would seriously uh, fund our border security. If fully funded, our nation would be able to hire 1,300 additional law enforcement officers at our southern border. We would be able to invest in southwest border ports of entry uh, with cutting edge uh, uh, detection technology to enhance uh, inspection capabilities, including fentanyl detection. We should make real investments uh, in strengthening the lawful pipeline of immigrants to our nation, not choking it off. So my hope, uh, and this is just my start, is that we can work together uh, on a long-term strategy for comprehensive uh, immigration reform. Uh, with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen, yields. The uh, chair recognizes Mr. Davidson. I uh, thank the chairman. I appreciate the witnesses being willing to come back, and I'm quite excited to be able to get in under the uh, deadline here. So, um, you know, Mr. Secretary, I, I think you know, for, for my lifetime, we've kind of been in this back and forth. Uh, you know, it's border security, it's immigration, border security, immigration. As we've seen today, uh, the two parties don't really agree much on those two solutions. Um, I can't say that it's been an incredibly productive dialogue on this. We haven't changed anybody's minds, I don't think. But I hope we can at least agree to stop the cartels. The cartels are bad people. They're doing evil things, and they're exploiting our broken laws and they're causing many of the disastrous situations in Mexico, Central, and South America. Last summer, I introduced a bill, the Stop the Cartels Act. I've subsequently renamed it the Lizzie Murphy Act to Stop the Cartels, named after a 21-year-old young lady in my district, daughter of a good friend, who took a Xanax at a party that was laced with fentanyl. And like tens of thousands of other Americans, she died because the drug she took not a good idea, but they're not supposed to kill you. Uh, poisoned with fentanyl, and it ended her life tragically. As I was introducing that bill last summer, the New York Times um, introduced independent reported journalism and said that under Trump, there was a problem at the border. The cartels were exploiting, the, and they were making around $500 million a year smuggling people across the border. And that's a pretty big problem. But in a year and a half, into the Biden administration, as of last summer, it was over $13 billion. Now, I was a businessman before I got into Congress. 26X your business in a year and a half? I mean, that's insane. $13 billion of growth. Another year on, and the problem's only gotten worse. In your expert opinion, as a former Secretary of Homeland Security, how can we most effectively stop the cartels? Well, Congressman, I agree with you. I think the cartel should be public enemy number one for the United States. There's no other driver that kills 100,000 Americans every single year, particularly as it relates to fentanyl. I think, as I've said uh, repeatedly and I've been questioned, all options should be on the table when it comes to the cartels. What we have done historically is treated this issue as a law enforcement issue. Uh, and I would say that we have made incremental improvements around the edges, but we have not addressed the issue. You also need to provide leverage, and you got to have you, you need an administration willing to use the leverage against the government of Mexico. When this administration and this president this says, "I will never designate them as a foreign terrorist organization. I will never use military force. I will never do X, Y, and Z." It takes all the leverage that they would normally have, and government of Mexico officials are going to say, "Well, I don't need to do anything else because there's no repercussions. There's nothing that is going to severely impact me." So there's a number of things that you could be doing along that border and with the leverage that we have, foreign assistance, which I know is, is important to this committee and, and other things, there are leverage points that the U.S. government could be using to get more action and activity out of the government of Mexico and we're not doing it. Thank you. I, I do hope we can reframe the debate so we can at least agree to stop the cartels. As far as I know, there's no pro-cartel lobbyists here in D.C. Now, I will say there are no Republican-led sanctuary cities and that's kind of a pro-cartel activity. So uh, I'm concerned about that. It would be highly more effective, though, if people in Mexico and Central America, South America, solved their problems domestically. That would take away the whole credible fear uh, claims that, that didn't end up showing at our border, correct? Uh, so, so it seems like there's a unanimous consent there by our, by our witnesses. And I just wonder, you know, in, in El Salvador, Probably not something that would go over well with our Bill of Rights in America, but seems to be pretty effective. Looks pretty peaceful and safe for people that aren't, aren't causing harm to their neighbors. Does anyone feel like uh, what's going on in El Salvador has been effective? 
in the in the short term, yes. Uh, ask in five years. I do worry about a, a permanent state of emergency and what that does, and when there's no checks and balances on presidential power. Okay. I I think what President Bukele has done in El Salvador is a miracle, and you should uh, in every Western country across the world we should target criminals and gangs and cartels, round them up and detain them, and incarcerate them for as long as we can. I think the. Um What's also very illustrative uh, about El Salvador is about a third of their GDP comes from remittances yeah. here in the United States. And so you've, we've got to deal with this issue. I, I, I certainly agree with what he's doing regarding criminals, uh, but we've got to provide other incentives for these countries to retain their talent, to retain their... Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, my time's running out. And look, I, I, I think that's right. And I think, look, I'm encouraged by developments in Ecuador and Argentina. And uh, we've got a lot of promise in this Western Hemisphere as we close in on the... 100th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. I hope we protect our own backyard. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm actually the only person to ask you questions today who represents a border community. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's important because illegal, illegally acting Secretary Wolf, as you said, um, some people just think about this issue. Um, I actually live it every day, as does my community uh, in San Diego. Uh, and what's interesting is despite all of the fear mongering uh, here today, San Diego is not by coincidence, one of the safest cities in this country, as is every other border community. Um, and I, we've heard my colleagues talk a lot about cartels. Let's talk about cartels a little bit. The growth of cartels um, has been mentioned a lot. Um, but what my colleagues don't seem to mention is that actually MPP assisted in the growth of the cartels. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to recognize that. So, Mr. Isaacson, isn't it true that MPP, in fact, did not stop people from fleeing violence? It just trapped them in dangerous situations in Mexico and that it fed the cartels and other criminal gangs on the Mexico side of the border. I heard numerous testimonies that cartels were waiting, um, as happened with Title 42, too, waiting at the gates of the port of entry for new kidnapped victims who they could then uh, extort their relatives in the United States which, of course, is a crime that crosses borders. So you would say that MPP did not, in fact, get rid of the cartels? If anything, it gave them some, some new fuel. Okay. We've heard a lot about fentanyl. Uh, would, you, uh, would you agree with what I've heard from all of the CBP officers that I spend a lot of time talking to, again, in the border community that I live in and represent, that almost all of the fentanyl that they see, and we have lots of folks between ports of entry and San Diego as well. Almost all uh, are through legal uh, people crossing the borders legally at, parts, at ports of entry. Every statistic I've seen, every conversation I've had with law enforcement says that. I mean, if you're, if you're apprehending two million people a year between the ports of entry and they don't have fentanyl on them, that should tell you a lot. Thank you. Um, and uh, we've also talked uh, a lot here today about following the law and what's illegal and illegal. Is seeking asylum illegal? It is legal without regard to how you arrived in the United States. Okay, thank you. And um, the Migrant Protection po Protocol, MPP, um, could you tell us, uh, was it legal in terms of the international laws and obligations that the United States is party to? Um, it is on our books as a law that no president had dared to use before, um, but the UNHCR and all interna international bodies did issue opinions saying it violated international standards. Okay, so the very thing you guys are trying to propose as the way to make things more legal is in fact illegal under international law and seeking asylum is in fact legal under both domestic and international law. Um, I've also heard a lot of uh, first-hand accounts um, from CPP agents of the logistical nightmare that MPP caused for them. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, could you speak to that? Well, I mean, sure, it, it meant uh, trying to send people back and make them wait and then have them show up at four in the morning. I think this is what you're referring to. Come to these video courts uh, and, and then send them back again with another court date and going back and forth and back and forth. And of course, that logistically got, became even more of a nightmare after Title 42 and the shutdown of immigration courts in the first months of the pandemic. So did MPP actually make our border more orderly? Um, if anything, there was quite a bit more chaos there during the second half of 2019. So the Migrant Protection Protocol is illegal under international law, made our border more chaotic, increased the cartel's ability to extort people and 
uh, grew their base. Um, and yet this is what uh, my colleagues and your other panelists are proposing as the solution to the very real situation that my constituents are dealing with living at the border community. Yes. Is that right? Yes, and like every other deterrence effort, it had a short-term effect that was already starting to bottom out when the pandemic hit. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back from uh, this Jolie very ridiculous back. Let me hearing. just say to the witnesses, we have very limited time on the floor. Uh, Ms. Salazar, you have five minutes. You can take the chair, but I don't want to miss the votes. Um, really appreciate your uh, generosity, willing to remain here till 5. We should be returning at 5 p.m. Okay. And I will turn it over to Ms. Salazar. Thank you for your patience and thank you to the chairman for lending me his chair. I feel important. So um, I want to continue, Mr. Wolf and uh, Mr. Hamilton, because your your opinion is is highly highly important. And as I was telling you, I am your ally. I am on your side. I I want to accomplish the same goals as you. Let me just um, give you a couple of ideas, and I want you to tell me, Mr. Wolf, what do you think of what I'm going to tell you? Let's suppose that by um, we have the ability to seal the border with the best technology. Seal the border, best technology, whether it's structure or whether it's um, high towers and infrared cameras, whatever technology is out there. We can increase the number of border patrols. We can increase the uh, administrative judges. We can increase immigration judges. We stop catch and release. Everyone that is claiming asylum, um, goes into something called that humanitarian campus for 60 days. And over there, we'll have enough personnel to determine if they could, if they are granted the asylum, and if they are not, they, they will be returned home. What do you think about that idea? Sorry. Uh, a number of those are obviously hypothetical situations. I think a number of them uh, certainly deserve merit to look at further? But I'm saying that let's suppose that it's, it's doable. You seal the border, you create humanitarian centers, five of I think them detaining along. I mean, yeah. it sounds, sounds correct, right? I think it's a yes. All right. So let's suppose that we can do that and then at some point we can then look inside and determine what are we going to do with the illegals. Do you think that we could uh, do that and at the same time give some type of not path to citizenship not immediate citizenship to the illegals, but some type of work, go home for Christmas, don't get deported, don't get any federal programs, buy your own health insurance. Do you think that maybe we could, we could work something out? Do you think that, there, that there's appetite in, and, uh, in this party and in people like you in very high positions when it comes to immigration in something like that? It's important, your opinion is very important, so that's why I'm asking you. Yeah, I think that's certainly a, a, an issue that Congress needs to deal with. I think what you said initially is very, very important, that you have to close these loopholes, and there are many that continue to incentivize. So if you deal with the illegal population here today, but yet in two years or three years from now, you let another 10, 20 million in because the loopholes continue, you haven't solved anything. Okay, so stop, very, stop very right important. there. But we will have sealed the border with the best technology there is. It's not just technology, it's also policies. And what do you mean by policy? Well, we, we, we can go down the line. You've got to have right. MPP. You've got, you know, if you're not detaining everyone, uh, MPP is certainly there. You've got to address the asylum system. If you well, I just told everyone. you, the, but I just, I just told you, sir, the asylum system is going to be addressed by everyone who is coming and claiming asylum needs to go into something called a humanitarian center. It's not going to go get lost in Miami. Right. It's going to stay there for 60 days. Do you like that idea? That's good. That ends and completely ends and stops. I like dating the idea the of addressing the asylum process very quickly. And if it's within 60 days, 60 or 90, days. I, I am for addressing the asylum process quickly. So you are in favor of keeping people for 60 days and you're in favor of sealing the border. I am in favor of addressing the asylum system and making sure we get those who need protections quickly and those who don't need Go to home. be removed correctly. And then increasing border patrol, 
and increasing the judges and increasing administrative immigration, administrative personnel. I think all of those would help That's the helps, asylum right? system. So then if that were to be in place, then what are we going to do with the people who have been here for more than five years, don't have any type of criminal records? What are we going to do with the illegal population? I think that's basically something that you told me that is challenging. So what is your idea? What do we do I, with I that? I think it's a, it, that's only a question that Congress can answer because Congress can provide them either certain protections and certain benefits, if you're talking about work authorization, whatever it, whatever it may be, that's certainly That's what I'm trying to do, but I need that, people like you to support ideas like mine because your opinion is I, highly I'm estimated. Hi <laughs> I'm highly skeptical that we can get to the first part of your equation there. But with, there's with no way that we can get to completely. the third if we don't have the first one sealed, which is sealing the border. So that's why I'm saying we agree. We agree, you just have to do it. And stopping catch and release and not gaming the asylum system. Thank you very much. And sorry, I, um, I, yeah. So votes have been called on the floor. So without objection, the committee will stand in recess and reconvene once the votes have ended.
Committee will reconvene. I will now recognize Ms. Manning for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the granddaughter of immigrants who came to this country fleeing religious persecution, I'd like to associate myself with Representative Dean's remarks. Now, it's clear that we are facing a migration crisis in the Western Hemisphere and that our immigration system is broken. But Congress has failed to pass meaningful, comprehensive, bipartisan uh, immigration reform for more than 30 years. It's up to us to fix this problem. We need comprehensive bipartisan immigration reform, including border security. We have a dramatic wor workforce shortage in this country. No matter where I go in my district, business owners tell me that they cannot find enough workers to hire. They have asked me why we can't have more legal immigrants and why we can't get work authorization for people who are desperate to come here and work hard to support their families. Our businesses have good jobs they cannot fill at, at all skill levels. This is preventing businesses from growing. The fact is our system of legal immigration is outdated. It's not in our country's economic best interest. It needs to be updated. We last had comprehensive immigration reform in 1986, before we had laptop computers, before we had cell phones, before some of my colleagues were even born. That is why I helped introduce the Bipartisan Dignity Act alongside Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and my colleagues on this committee, Representatives Maria Salazar and Ma Mike Lawler. That bill has increased funding for humane border control, for dramatically speeding up the asylum process, and updates our legal immigration system in a way that will help our country's economic needs. So I wish members of our committee would spend time discussing the need for, le for immigration reform, both at the border area and also up and down the legal immigration system. And I hope that people on this committee will look at the Dignity Act and find it in their, uh, in their economic interest to support that. So Mr. Isaacson, let me turn to you. What does Congress's continued inaction on immigration mean in terms of the number of people that will continue to make the dangerous trip to our southern border because we don't have legal options for them? That's an excellent question. And thank you so much for your work on the Dignity Act, which is, you know, I have some critique of it, but it's a good first step. It's not a perfect bill. No, there are things I love and there are things I hate, which is what we are going to have to do if we ever get a bipartisan immigration bill passed. I applaud that spirit. But in, in answer to your question, I mean, as we're still with our framework from the 1990s of, of immigration, if somebody wants protection, what are their choices right now? There are maybe 20,000 spots for the refugee program, tiny little Central America migrants program, uh, uh, minors program. There's uh, some tiny, you know, uh, uh, humanitarian parole programs and uh, family reunification programs. Maybe you can luck out and get a temporary work visa, but that doesn't offer you protection. You're, you have to go back. Um, and so that creates this only other option, which should be an absolute last resort, which is to go across all of these countries for hundreds of miles, set foot on U.S. soil, usually at the U.S.-Mexico border. So, Mr. Isaacson, I know the administration has put significant effort into trying to deliver increased private sector investment in Central America mm -hmm. to try to provide more opportunities for people who live there. Has this been sufficient, and is there more we can do to help those economies grow? The private sector investment can create some good jobs for a few percentage points of the population that is very important, uh, especially in the short term when you're trying to you know, give people one less incentive to leave. Um, we have to think about the medium and long term too, which is, again, anti-corruption, in uh, education, protecting human rights, protecting democracy, making people feel they have a future and that their country they live in has a future. And yeah, private sector investment is part of that. So our Dignity Act provides resources to allow migrants to undergo credible fear interviews and apply for asylum in third countries or in their countries of origin. And I understand the Biden administration is working on a system like this to have regional processing centers. Would this help us? 
being able to access some way of getting protection without having to make that journey would definitely be a help. I mean, you'd have to create something new in the law, what you're proposing to do. Thank you. My time is about to expire. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Manning. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Baird and recognize him for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I appreciate, I thought a few witnesses were willing to come back after we voted. The least I could do is come back and ask some kind of question. So anyway, thank you for doing that, giving us the opportunity to, to ask questions. But you know, my, uh, my interest is the is the fact that, uh, and some of this has already been mentioned, and we've been focusing on our southern border, and the astronomical numbers of people that are coming into our country, and uh, the border patrol have recently seen a major change in the crossings, not so much Venezuelans, Hondurans, or Guatemalans, but the Chinese, and so a recent article reported that more than 24,000 Chinese citizens have been apprehended in the past year, making that more than in the past 10 years alone. So, Mr. Isaacson, Isaacson uh, in your experience with regional security, what are the regional policy changes that the United States faces with Latin America when it comes to mass migration and their relationship to China? And then has there been a new agreement between Latin American countries and China that have caused this increase in the Chinese immigration at our southern border? I think the increase in Chinese immigration owes to a worsening of repression under the Xi regime. For about 15 years now, some Chinese have been coming generally to Ecuador. Ecuador changed its constitution about 15 years ago to say that migration is a right and they don't require visas of almost anybody. So you can fly to Ecuador, and yeah, start your journey through all of those countries all the way up to the U.S. border. That really picked up a lot for Chinese, Russians, Turks, and Indians in the last year or two. All of them, many of them have very strong asylum cases, but that's what we're seeing. I was just at the Ecuador-Colombia border and saw a lot of Chinese people with Chinese passports, usually pretty middle class. And uh, yeah, I wish I could talk to them because they didn't have English or Spanish. Do you think this, is, this trend is going to continue or increase or? It could increase somewhat, although it's sort of the Chinese who are coming are the ones who can avoid to the extent possible the Darien Gap, um, people with some resources. Poor Chinese won't really be able to ever make that trip. So you probably hit a ceiling pretty quickly, I think, and the number who can come. Well, you know, from my perspective, uh, I had some combat experience. The first thing you did when you move into a new area you set up a perimeter and you set up guards so that you could vet anyone coming or going, and that was a way to protect everyone. And so I think this kind of gets into that same kind of attitude about, about trying to protect everyone in the country. If there are those that are coming across the border to do nefarious things, right. then I think we have an obligation to have the chance to vet them. And so. You know, so anyway, I, I would ask any of the other witnesses if you had any thoughts about that question, about the Chinese coming across the border. Well, obviously, I, I think it's, again, a little naive to think that Chinese nationals did not want to come to the border in large numbers four years ago. Uh, but they didn't. And they didn't because policies were in place to deter that type of behavior. And you see them in such dramatic numbers uh, here recently because there's no policies to deter it. They know that if they show up, they will be released into American communities. Almost two to three, uh, they will be released. So this idea that somehow in the last two to three years, we've had a global migration crisis that we've never seen before defies reality. It's, it, it's not the facts. And as much as anyone wants to say that that's what's going on, what's going on is a dramatic change along that border that's fueling the crisis. There's always been people in the Western Hemisphere that have always wanted to come to the United States or go to other countries, and that's always going to continue. But the numbers that we're seeing today do not back this theory that there's some type of global migration crisis, and then all of a sudden, 250,000 people are going to show up at the southern border. The Remain in Mexico program did not apply to Chinese people. 
Mr. Hamilton, we got about 20 seconds. I, I would echo everything that uh, Secretary Wolf said um, about that. I would also add, though, that uh, to think that an adversary like China um, is not going to also, amongst the other folks who are coming here, but also not use it to their advantage in terms of espionage capabilities um, defies common sense. We would do the same thing <laughs> to any other country across the world if they had such an open border environment. So to say that they, oh, no one's ever going to come across the border um, and commit espionage or they're not going to do anything else just defies common sense and, and logic. Thank you. My time's up and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Chairman Call. In April of 20, 2022, Governor Abbott began chartering buses to transport migrants illegally entering the United States at the southern border between Texas and Mexico to Democratic-led large cities as part of Operation Lone Star. According to Governor Abbott, Operation Lone Star is intended to counter illegal immigration, the illegal drug trade, and human smuggling. Governor Abbott has indicated that Operation Lone Star is a direct response to what he deems to be insufficient and inadequate immigration and border enforcement policies by the Biden-Harris administration. To date, Governor Abbott, acting on behalf of the state of Texas, has transported more than 55,000 migrants to six sanctuary cities, namely New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Denver, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles. The city of Chicago, which is part that I represent, encompasses um, my congressional district, has received more than 23,000 migrants. And might I say you, it was five below zero on Monday morning in Chicago. Let me say that again, 23,000 migrants. On October 18, 2023, I sent a letter to the United States Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security requesting that each of these agencies launch investigations into the illegal activities of Governor Abbott and the state of Texas. First, to you, Mr. Wolf, would you agree that Governor Abbott's actions have exacerbated the crisis at the border? I would not agree with that. And why not? Uh, because the governor is faced with a difficult circumstance of trying to address and process, well, he's not processing, but to address the thousands, if not millions, of illegal aliens in the state of Texas. There's no more capacity. There's no more shelter space. He has no way to uh, care for these folks. And instead of turning them out onto the street, he is now, as you indicated, busing them to certain other cities around the country. Okay, just six targeted Democratic-led cities. That's Operation Lone Star. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm not speaking policy. for the governor. I'm just telling you what I'm what I'm seeing. And so as those buses go to cities like Chicago, New York, and elsewhere, and I think um, those cities are starting to understand what the what Texans, I Arizonians, think we understand and that well. others Let me finish have the been faced with the last three. How years. does busing migrants, many of them single women and children, to Democratic-led cities improve legal pathways for migration? deter illegal border crossings and enforce border and immigration laws in a lawful and orderly way. I would ask that of you, Mr. Hamilton. I think uh, the first point that I would make in response to that question is that Governor Abbott is a patriot and he's doing what he should do to protect his constituents. The notion his that- His constituents as Americans? His constituents as residents of the state of Texas. Okay. He, is, he has a constitutional obligation under the Constitution of Texas to protect his uh, constituents. The notion that these tens of thousands of people wouldn't also, maybe in smaller numbers, but wouldn't also be coming to Chicago into these other cities on their own accord or through the assistance of uh, NGOs and other organizations is, is false. I mean, they would eventually get there. The problem that we have is we have open border policies from this administration, and Governor Abbott should be applauded for doing Okay, thank you. That's your opinion. Uh, the other question I would have is, do you believe that Governor Abbott is engaging in human smuggling by concealing migrants from law enforcement and busing them specifically under his Operation Lone Star to Democratic-led cities? That's to you, Mr. Isaacs. 
I would only call it human smuggling if the, if the migrants had no choice about whether to go to the buses. Most of the time, they're in a border city. They've just been released from Border Patrol custody. Most of the time, they have to ask a relative to wire them some money so they can take a bus on their own, and the vast majority of them do that. Governor Abbott is saving their relatives money by helping send them to those cities. Um, the, if I had to change something strongly about what he was doing, what the, the worst thing he's not doing is not coordinating with the mayors and all the other local authorities in the cities on the receiving end so they can at least know who's coming uh, rather than they're just dumping them there. I yield back my time. Thank you very much for your participation. And I have a letter I would like to submit. Chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Uh, the gentleman has a unanimous consent, though. I'm sorry, I, I Mr. Jackson. No, I'm sorry, I'd like finish? to have a letter admitted into the record, please. You ask uh, unanimous consent? I do. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, is Texas a sanctuary state? Not to my knowledge, no. Do you know of any sanctuary cities within Texas? I, I don't. Um, Crazy East, Austin could be, but we're not sure. Austin right? or, or portions of Houston, but not to my knowledge. And similarly, Mr. Hamilton, uh, are each of the cities that Mr. Jackson described as Democrat-run cities, are each and every one of them sanctuary cities and have declared so? I believe that's correct, sir. And in fact, they have also said that they welcome immigrants and that they should not be deported and they want them in their communities. Uh, so let's, let's kind of go through the numbers here. Uh, we have several million people who have come over the border. I have 55 miles of the border. Uh, it includes some very dangerous areas to cross, desert and so on, and yet we have thousands and thousands coming every month. Uh, they come into San Diego. Now California is a sanctuary state, so the entire state is welcoming to them. And yet, more than 80% of them, when asked, will tell you where they're going, and it's not California. They are, in fact, going to Miami and other locations. So if, if the fact is that, that they, they generally have family or relatives, they know roughly where they're going, uh, realistically, is there anything wrong with sanctuary cities and sanctuary states being expected to take substantially all of these people that they've said are welcome and the non-sanctuary states having a reasonable right to be less welcoming? What I would tell you is that the situation along the border, it defies reality to the extent in the numbers that you're seeing that places I'm like- I'm going to in my, my area, they know it's reality. Yeah. My, my Hispanic community that live along the border are, are absolutely beyond belief. They just don't know what else to do because it represents people they would love to help, but there's just too yeah. many of them. And so the busing situation, it's a necessity. It's a necessity from those along the border. There is no more capacity. Um, and so when you talk about New York City, who's got a population of 9 million, and yes, they have to now you know, address an illegal alien population. What about communities in South Texas of, of 15,000, 20,000? When they get 15,000 illegal migrants, uh, almost a week in, in some instances. And so the busing, at least in my view, again, I'm not talking to Governor Abbott and others, it's a necessity because of a capacity issue because of the overwhelming numbers that are coming across. Now, you, you, you contrasted earlier the difference between uh, the previous administration and this administration in the, the sheer numbers with no explanation of uh, an event that would have changed it other than a change in policy. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's a change in a number of policies. Okay, a right. change in a number of policies. So suffice to say that if we all of us, all three of you, say that we are bringing in more people in a way that is not helpful and more than what Congress has authorized, which is about 1.4 million a year, if that's not the case, then by any uh, stretch of the imagination, shouldn't we, and this is the Foreign Affairs Committee, shouldn't we in fact be working with other countries to either hold these individuals so they can be more orderly brought in if appropriate, or in fact be part of helping discourage their immigration? And isn't that really what's absent right now is the any kind of discouragement well, we certainly talked earlier about it's a shared responsibility. Not only, it's not just a U.S. responsibility, Mexico, Central America, and South America, and others. So yes, I would certainly agree that, I would say that our partners need to do more, 
but they need to see that the U.S. is doing more, and, they're, and, and they don't currently see that. Well, now, let me just ask one question. Any, all of you can answer this, because I think it's, it's known by all of you. Isn't it true that international law, if you want to claim refugee status or asylum, in fact, requires that you make it at the first safe location after leaving the country or the region, and that, in fact, with the exception of Mexico and Canada, virtually all of the people coming to our shores have, in fact, passed through intervening countries without making application? Uh, it, it's a well-established practice that you need to seek safety in the closest third country, imagine, you know, as you can to your home country. This idea that you're going to forum shop, that you're going to transit three, four, five, six, seven different safe countries because you prefer the United States, uh, not because you need protection from persecution or something else. If that's truly the case, you're going to seek safety in the closest place imaginable. I prefer first class, but I sit in coach because that's the seat that I purchased. Mr. Chairman, uh, there's no question at all that you've done a good job today uh, with witnesses of establishing that this is a policy decision that could be reversed, should be reversed, and that the President is ultimately responsible for a policy that has led America, including our major cities, in turmoil. I thank you for holding this hearing and yield back. And I thank the uh, Chairman to Chairman. I, I, I think that uh, we would like to get this in our National Security Supplemental Bill, and I've talked to the Senate about it. If we could get this in that Supplemental Bill, it would make such a difference. So thank you for your kind words. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I first want to start out, uh, I had this whole list of questions that I was wanting to ask the witnesses, but I first want to address some of the idiocy of those who are in this committee who actually were making statements that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, we hear all the time, and Mr. Hamilton, I have to agree with you tremendously on what you're talking about with regards to opportunist. And I also want to thank you for finally doing what we and most of us in this, in this committee has done, which is recognizing that China is an adversary, not an actual competitor. So let me just address a few things. Let's talk about opportunism. Many are saying that they're coming to America because they are scared of the violent crimes that are occurring in their cities, that they are feeling as if they are, are, are unwelcome or that they're somehow um, you know, looking at the criminality rates in their, in their you know, country and saying that, well, we have to escape for the following reasons and that's why we should seek asylum. But let's point out some facts here. We had, just by the CBP's leaked document of October 23, they said we have 6,386 Afghanis, 3,153 Egyptians, 659 Iranians, 123 Iraqis, 185 Jordanians, 164 Lebanese, 24,000 Chinese, 15,594 Mauritanians, 1,613 Pakistanis, 538 Syrians, 30,830 Turkish, 13,624 Uzbek, 139 from Yemen, that is a lot of countries that they would have to have skipped in order to try and seek asylum that would have actually been able to house them for fears of criminality. But let's go back to one of the numbers, 1613, 1613 Pakistanis. Well, it's interesting because if you look at the homicide murder rate in Pakistan and it's 3.98%, I can look at the city of Chicago, which is 29.6%. That's actually more dangerous. Maybe there should be people who are actually trying to exfil out to Islamabad. And I also want to point out the fact that they continue to try and talk about kids in cages. And Mr. Isaacson, you were very proud and kind of almost in a smirkish way was saying, well, Trump was doing this. Does that not continue to go under the Obama and Biden administration where there is a separation of children from the unaccompanied minors or a detention? What we saw under Obama, yeah. I'll tell you, I went to the processing center. But you, you didn't say Obama there, right? You, you were proud to smirk in front of my colleague, Mr. Connolly, who likes to, and I'm still hoping that he'll seek treatment for his Trump derangement syndrome. But my whole thing is, is that we continue to see the same thing where one wants to come in and play as if this is a partisan tool. But let's talk about partisanship because we're all talking about remain in Mexico, right? The illegality as they're trying to claim. The only thing that's illegal right now is the way that this administration is handling things. But 
our liberal colleagues in Congress want to pretend that the Trump administration's implementation of MPP was some recent, lawless, irrational invention of the prior administration. But the truth is that the legal foundation of MPP has actually been on the books since the Clinton administration. Mr. Hamilton, you've dealt with the legalities of this. Could you speak to the fact of whether or not that is a true or incorrect statement? That is an absolutely true statement, 100 uh, percent. The Congress dealt with that on a bipartisan basis. And in fact, uh, I don't have the vote count on the top of my head, but it was a bipartisan vote of, of massive support for IRA IRA and its passage. So the notion that, you know, there, there was this is some kind of conservative uh, conspiracy and this is intended to be uh, uh, harmful to people of certain backgrounds and things, just nothing could be farther from the truth. Well, and I'll tell you what's interesting. You know, my colleagues on the left continue to want to say that border walls don't work, but we saw how quickly Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats put a border wall around the Capitol, right? But they don't work. Let's just go ahead and put it that way. Secretary Wolf, you've been taking hits left and right because you actually believe in keeping our nation secure. And I would argue that whether it was trying to make Title 42 something that we could keep in place as a permanent codified law, whether it is to replace or put back in place the Remain in Mexico agreement, that we were far safer and that our numbers were lower. But let's just look at statistics. In 2018, you had the drug cartels that were making around $500 million a year. A lot of money. Fast forward to 2021 under Joe Biden, it's around $13 billion, of which 40 plus percent in what? Child and human sex trafficking. But yet they want to talk about the inhumanity, if you will. The same people who won't refer to Chinese as competitors, or sorry, as adversaries, who are grossly inhumane in the way that they treat Uyghur. So it's just funny to me that we continue to hear this partisan rhetoric and nonsense from the people who want to say, well, we're shipping people illegally to the sanctuary cities. Well, isn't that exactly what you were asking for? Didn't you say that we are a sanctuary city that's welcoming? Which law? They want to say that was illegal to transport them. No, it was illegal when they came here. And I'll say one more thing. We are, in fact, a nation of immigrants, a nation of legal migration. And I will tell you right now that I would love to not just see Remain in Mexico, Title 42, build our border wall, have an early detection awareness that is a cyber and a uh, ISR capability, increase our CBP's strengths, be able to allow ICE to deport those who are actually there, stop the subsidies that is going to illegals, which would allow them to self-deport, and actually protect and realize that we're elected by Americans, not by the illegals who continue to violate our sovereignty. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen yields, last but not least, I appreciate y'all's patience. Mr. Lawler from New York. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we have a migrant crisis in this country, uh, one that has exploded under the current administration. Just under 10 million migrants have crossed our southern border since Joe Biden took office. Now, as a New Yorker, uh, I understand full well that we are a nation of immigrants. My great-grandparents came through Ellis Island. My wife is an immigrant. I've been through this process. It is a fundamentally broken system. We must secure the border. We must stop this massive influx of illegal immigration, human trafficking, fentanyl trafficking, fentanyl pouring into our communities, killing 70,000 Americans last year alone. And people are upset because the governor of a southern border state, which has been overrun for decades, had the temerity to transport migrants up to New York. Joe Biden was flying migrants into my district, Westchester County Airport, on midnight flights, secret flights, nobody was supposed to know about, long before Governor Abbott started sending anyone to New York. My Democratic colleagues in New York didn't have boo to say about it. Why? Because they didn't care. Because it didn't impact them. They say, we're a sanctuary state and a sanctuary city. They use 
billions in taxpayer funds to provide free housing, free health care, free education, free food, free clothing for undocumented migrants. And now, because it has impacted them, they are complaining. The mayor of New York City, after saying we welcome them, in fact, going to the Port Authority bus terminal to welcome them, now says this crisis is destroying New York City, now says that we need to cut the NYPD budget at a time when crime is still at record highs. This is an absolute disgrace. This problem can be solved very simply. Secure the damn border. Increase border personnel. Increase court personnel to hear these asylum cases expeditiously. These asylum cases are taking two to three years to be heard at a minimum, and nearly two-thirds of them are rejected when they are heard because poverty in and of itself is not a prerequisite for asylum. It is tragic. We need to work with our allies in the Western Hemisphere to address many of the challenges. You see the crisis in Venezuela. You see the crisis in Haiti. These are real challenges that we have to deal with. But just leaving our border wide open is not solving the problem. Now, I've heard for years, oh, we have about 11 and a half million undocumented immigrants in this country. Well, when you're adding 9.6 million immigrants who are here illegally, who are waiting for their asylum case to be heard, it's a lot more than an 11 and a half. We're talking upwards of over 20 million people who are here illegally. We have to deal with that. You're not rounding everybody up and kicking them out. We all know that. And anybody who suggests otherwise is full of crap. But we have to deal with this. And we have to deal with a legal immigration system that is fundamentally broken. These arbitrary caps that have been in place for decades Immigration hasn't been reformed since 1986. I was born in 1986. This is a joke. We should be making immigration decisions based on our economic needs. We have a shortage of doctors, of nurses, of home health aides. Instead, we're saying, oh, if you're from this country, no, you've, you've hit your cap. What? It's foolish. It makes no sense. So let's start with one fundamental truth which is that under Joe Biden, nearly 10 million migrants have crossed our southern border. This administration has failed miserably, miserably, to deal with the migrant crisis. And for Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams to act as though they're shocked and outraged when they enact policies like sanctuary cities, like refusal to cooperate with ICE, like using taxpayer money to pay for free housing, health care, and, and, and the like, give me a break. Let's secure the damn border. I yield back. and fix this problem without the partisan rhetoric because certain things do work. And I think what, the, you know, what you did in the prior administration worked, regardless of who the president was. Um, and it was very effective. And so let's try to bring back the things that work and things that don't work, then, you know, we don't have to do those. So, um, you know, I want to thank all of you for being here today and uh, your patience. This has been a very, very long day. Uh, but... Uh, I want to thank you so much, and uh, some members may have questions in writing, and um, again, want to thank you all, and with that, the committee stands adjourned. It's funny.
Why is Mason's mic on?